Hello everyone. Welcome to the Anacode Chamber. This is a little bit different from our traditional content. Whereas normally we will have a dialogue between the speaker and the host. In this case, this is more of the speaker on autopilot. Today, Ben is going to be presenting his candidacy talk. Originally, I missed his candidacy talk because I'm a jackass. And even though it was in my calendar, somehow both my wife and I didn't see the reminder and missed it, even though we had nothing else going on at the moment. So, my bad. Fortunately, Ben was willing to come down here and give the presentation again. Now, this is actually kind of cool because most people don't have the opportunity to see a candidacy talk. It's not that it's secret information or anything like that. This isn't Illuminati. This is... It's just, it's so narrowly scoped, the audience that you would typically expect to have an interest in it. Because when you're operating at the PhD level of physics, you have specialized extremely narrowly in a particular topic. You are trying to reach the level of knowledge that everyone who has come before you, and then a little bit more. And when you reach that point of a little bit more, you package it all up in something known as a thesis, you publish it, you defend it, and then you become a doctor in physics. PhD. Usually a candidacy talk is given after all graduate courses have been completed, and at this point a student has been studying physics for seven or eight years. The candidacy talk is a culmination of three to four years of work, collecting and presenting research. In the talk, you'll show why the work you're doing is worth pursuing and deliver a plan of what you hope to accomplish with your research. The worst thing you could do when watching content like this is to think that you're not smart enough to understand it or it's over your head or whatever. You may not have the background to fully understand what Ben's saying. And indeed, probably in this world of seven plus billion people, there's maybe a few hundred to a few thousand people, and that could be a stretch, that will actually be able to follow his talk from beginning to end without having to interject questions and you know get him to elaborate further. That's how PhDs work. You don't start studying something with the intent of just knowing it as well as the previous person knows it and then stopping. You're trying to iterate or improve upon previous work with your PhD. In fact, that's what your PhD thesis is all about. You spent years learning enough to become a subject matter expert in the topic. Then you spent years further coming up with an idea and then proving that idea or massaging that idea to the point where it is now an improvement of the prior body of work. And this is the prior body of work of the entire world and of all of history. That's what's so cool about PhDs. Now, the type of work that Ben does is not, this is mathematical physics, this is not something where you just push a button and a little machine runs and then out comes this special result that suddenly the rest of the world or the entire world then it's like, oh wow, check this great thing out. Ben's work is more of a tool for other physicists and mathematicians who are trying to figure out something that might be totally unrelated to anything that he's even looked at. But because it's a tool and it's a mathematical technique for narrowing the scope of search, and in this case it's going to be phase changes, when does a phase change occur, it has the potential to lead to other breakthroughs. It might not be the breakthrough that suddenly we have warp drive and we're tell you know transporting up to our starships and things like that that's not the type of breakthrough that this is this is the type of breakthrough when another physicist or another group or team of physicists sits down and is like hey we want to make an improvement in this thing we want to study this thing more they would then use the techniques that ben and his team have devised to narrow the amount of work that they have to do Okay, I've blathered on enough about this. Enjoy. Yeah. 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 Live. Cool. So, Ben. Hey. I want to apologize again for not making it to this. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, I had a few friends that I invited to come see, right, talk, listen to me talk about my candidacy and my results. Uh, and I recently had, yeah, this, this, can, this oral candidacy talk. And of the friends who I thought, hmm, maybe I should remind them to show up. <laughs> you were the one I went, no, I can trust Rob to remember. He's very interested in this. Uh, he, he is, <laughs> and he was. And he had it in his calendar. <laughs> and I don't actually recall how we missed it. I, you know, I just sent you and was like, where were you? And you're like, wait, what? That was today? <laughs> yeah, because I you even said I put it in my calendar and everything. What? Yeah, he's not. No, not yet. it's on black screen. So. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I get an exclusive. Yeah. A little, a little. This, this is for all the people who uh, happen to not be able to. I had a couple other friends who, because of work, weren't able to see it. But one of the through lines is, uh, of, of my life is I've been at graduate school over at Notre Dame for the last more than four years, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it turns out when you go to graduate school, what you kind of are expected to do is to research something, particularly if you're in a PhD program. You're trying to extend, you know, what human knowledge, what we know about things. Uh, and if you've asked me that question of anyone out there who has of like, oh, what do you do? What do you study? Some people... Have it really easy. They go, they go, hey, look, I study the stars, right? Thank you, Dr. Gobey. What a beautiful, beautiful example. Right? It's easy to point to and go, yeah, here, I figure out this thing, and so we understand it better. Even something more esoteric, like I remember one of our old professors at USF, it was like, yeah, when you bend plastic, it makes, when the plastic goes from kind of being clear to whitish, well, I want to know why that happens. If you ask me that question, my answer is to pull out a napkin and go, look, if I curve how it shape, if I look at the curves of the shape, it tells me something about phase transitions and just kind of wave my hands uh, wildly, hoping that that will fix the raw misunderstanding that it, I am outputting. So having said that, uh, this talk is finally my best attempt to actually answer what the heck does Benjamin do over at Notre Dame? And the answer is, well, I study the un a way to create a universal formulation of phase transitions through the geometric properties of the density of states. Every paper, it's always got to be just word salad. It is. It is a important thing to use explicit, specific terms to make sure we are on exactly the same page. You're not wrong. It, it does end up looking a lot like word soup, but it is a way to make sure that there is as little ambiguity when I say something that compared to what I say and expect to, you know, make you think and what you actually think of. And so this is the research that I do over at the Department of Physics at Notre Dame. I work with my <laughs> advisor, Zoltan Traxkai, uh, wonderful advisor. He has uh, helped me a lot on this. And this project is something that's really cool. So we're going to go over four very, very basic things. What the heck is this word soup and why should anyone care? Mm -hmm. Then we're going to go over a little bit of the background of mathematics about how it works and why we should care about this density of states and its geometric properties. Then I'm going to show how our, our models, um, or rather this analysis, this framework, works on select models that we know have phase transitions, things that we you know, know should show up and show that, hey, this method actually predicts these things properly. And then at the very bit, there's going to be a little bit of like, hey, here's what I'm going to work on in the future. So let's start with the very basic things. What I work with in general is called a complex system. What is a complex system? Uh, it's a way of categorizing anything coming together. So lots of little pieces coming and making bulk, like big bulk behavior. Uh, in general, what we're doing is we have some data on some system. It could be as, as physical as the water in a glass or steam engine. It could be something like looking at migration patterns of animals throughout their habitats and trying to figure that out. Um, something that I can take measure some amount of data. And what I want to combine that with is some knowledge about how those actors, say the atoms in that water or the individual behaviors of the animals, how, uh, to combine those to be able to make predictions about what's going to happen to the larger system as it evolves through time, right? So in general, there are kind of two ways to go about this. If the combination of prior knowledge and data is sufficient, it's enough to determine everything, I can just say, aha, I know that from this state, we will end up in 10 seconds here. 
that's kind of the logic that we end up with when we are trying to look at physics, right? Like very classical physics. If I know uh, a ball, like the classic example, if I know a ball on a hill, I know where its position is on that hill and I know how fast it's moving at this moment and I know the shape of the hill, then I can tell you exactly where that ball will end up in 10 seconds. I can predict you perfectly. Right. Now, that's if I have sufficient information. There are some cases where there's not enough. From what I can measure, it doesn't determine the system enough. It's insufficient to fully determine everything and fully determine the dynamics. In that case, I have to make plausible reasons. I have to say, well, okay, it's likely that the ball will end up here. It's likely that the animals will move over to this, to this area of the ring. I have to infer what is happening. So is this a situation where, like the financial markets, where there's simply no amount of information you could collect, or you wouldn't know how to weight it properly in the first place. So, um, yeah, actually. So you 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 can in fact put um, our our methods right that saw work on complex systems and try and model the stock market as a complex system. And in fact, it outside of you know news events, it does pretty good on predicting and seeing how things will fluctuate. But it's that. Outside information that makes things so interesting, Indeed. right? Now, one of the one of the most prevalent and indicative features that you have a complex system is the appearance of what we'll call a phase transition. Right, it's a common feature of many complex of many complex systems, and what we're going to colloquially define as a phase transition, well, perhaps is best to put in terms of our everyday experiences. Right, the most Everyday thing that I could look at, matter. Physics in general sees phase transitions. I look at my glass of water and it has, it's even though it's made up of only water molecules, I see two vastly different behaviors in this picture here, right? I see a glass of water that contains liquid water and ice, which is solid, solid state water. So the collection of atoms in the system can go through wildly different, can behave wildly differently based upon the environment I place it into, right? If I put this glass of water outside, you know, uh, well... Probably right now. Yeah, <laughs> but if I sit it outside, uh, it's going to end up all solid. It will freeze. But that's very different than if I, you know, we go two months, no, more than that, whatever. I, I, we go back to summer and I put it out in the sun. What will happen there is eventually all that water will just disappear. And it's not like evaporates and or excuse me not like it just blinks out of existence instead the water evaporates it goes from being liquid to a gas and that gas behaves incredibly differently than the liquid that i started with the same way with the solid right mm -hmm. but this is not limited to environmental physics this is not limited to just atoms anytime it seems that i have a bunch of small things coming together and becoming a big thing uh, or, or with, with bulk behaviors, I see this, right? Like I mentioned, in biology, we see this. We see it in things like herd migration and foraging. There's a couple of studies on, here what they did, the phase transitions in ant patterns for a system that they set up. As you were just pointing out, we see phase transition in economics. You can model crashes in the market as these phase transitions, as done by um, Redont and Wagner in 2013. One of the most interesting places that I looked, actually, to find these is you can even find it in uh, areas of psychology. There are models for such esoteric things as human cognition showing up as a phase transition or the use of which hand you're gesticulating with or how, uh, whether you're using one or both can be modeled as a phase transition, as, as wildly different behaviors based on an environment your system is placed into. Okay. So let me go back to biology for a second. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example and tell me if this is a phase transition. Let's say we're, we're all in a stadium and we're watching a football game. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the home team scores and everybody rises up as one on one side of the stadium. Is that a phase transition in this lingo that we're talking about here? Yeah, that could count. Uh, what I would more put that uh, is the difference between watching your home team doing poorly right? They're getting beaten by the away team versus 
as let's say as the game goes on the environment you put the crowd into when your home team starts scoring and catching up there's an energy that builds in the crowd and all of a sudden you go from people being kind of you know depressed not enjoying what they're doing to cheering loudly to being very excited there's a wide difference in the behavior of those people based on whether your home team's doing poorly or your home team is doing great Okay. Right. Or let's say your team is doing great, and then the ref makes a call that everyone hates. Exactly. If your team is if your team is doing an, is is in a, this high energy state, then those calls that the that the ref will make are going to make a bigger impact. Are going to cause much uh, wider behavior in your crowd than if you know they're they're doing bad. No one cares. Oh, the ref called against us. Whatever. Okay. Right. That could be a, a, a notion. A phase transition, depending on how we go about calculating these systems. But yeah. Okay. And then going to the psychology. So I chose to use my left hand there. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that there's some type of, not that you could 100% predict exactly what I'm going to do, but there's some type of phase transition. Right. So according going to, I, on there. I didn't read this particular paper in too much depth as I was putting this together, but, I, but effectively what I did was look up field and then type phase transition and go, oh, wow, look at these cool things that people are studying. I, I did poke into this uh, paper. I'm not exactly sure here the what they're considering is the environment that they're putting in, in relation to, but effectively the frequency of hand use can be modeled as like some sort of sign function, which is strange and incredibly interesting. I just haven't had time to delve into the specific paper itself. Um, certainly an interesting thing. So... Now, of mm. all of these, one of the first things that popped out that, that showed how to model a complex system was physics, was statistical mechanics. We, in statistical mechanics, we have the, the best rounded framework, and it provides, us a, it provides us a way of predicting mean quantities of relevant things that we're interested in. It allows us to create predictive relationship between those quantities and to verify are models of small scale behavior by the large scale behavior that we're actually able to measure, right? For example, one of the ways that we can look at and say, oh, okay, our model of ideal gas law is pretty good because when I use those laws to say that atoms, you know, atoms in an ideal gas, basically a noble gas, basically act like little ping pong balls um, bouncing off and having elastic collisions. And I'm able to, from start, from assuming that's how reality is, derive the laws that we actually see on, large scale, on, on the large scale, derive the ideal gas law, derive the energy that I would have in an ideal gas based on the temperature that I place it into. Okay, so what you're saying there is, is you're using, let's say we, we have a collection of helium atoms mm -hmm. and we, we kind of know how they're going to act individually. Statistical mechanics lets us know if we take 10 trillion of those things, stick them in a balloon, is the balloon going to do this? So we know we it's it's actually kind of the opposite way. Okay. What it is is I I have information about how 10 trillion of them will act, right? I have pretty good idea of how they will behave on the large scale. And the question is, how can I ascertain what's happening on the small scale? Well, the way to do that is to guess at what's happening at the small scale. And from that, can I derive back to what I know is the case on the big scale? Okay. Right. And once I can do that, I can say, oh, okay, this must be a pretty good theory because it reproduces the empirical results that I'm able to get my at, my hands on. Right. We've talked a lot about this this filling in of what reality actually is slowly, you know, stripping away and, and getting a better and better picture. So even if we can't know right what the small scale is from the large scale it the it does give us a tool to throw out bad candidates if i have a guess that you know all atoms stay sticky and just kind of clump up i can't derive the large scale behavior of the ideal gas law if i if i guess that that's how ideal gas atoms worked and so i can say hey, no that's a bad theory it might there might be false positives i might be able to come up with a theory that isn't quite right but still Rederives ideal gas law for me, but then I'm going to just have to develop better, you know, understanding of large scale laws. Okay, Does that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the last thing is that it is statistical mechanics does in its framework 
allow for techniques to distinguish when these these phase transitions I was talking about these these appearances of vastly different behaviors from the same set of 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 small pieces interacting together based on the environment you place them into basically based on you know how what temperature do I put that water at if I put it at room temperature versus freezing versus very hot right that that kind of behavior um and that predictive power that statistical mechanics has is really appealing. And so because of that, a lot of people have tried to apply statistical mechanics to their complex systems. That's what we see with a lot of these. So with that said, let's figure a little bit about statistical mechanics. Ooh. So we're going to analyze this uh, in terms of you know, the most familiar way that people originally derived this, which is going to be physical systems, right? I'm going to look at what happens if I have this much gas or that much water. Uh, in these systems, usually what you're going to have is you're going to have a number of particles in on the order of 10 to the 23. Avogadro's number, the number in a mole, right? Uh, a lot of particles. Each, uh, each of those particles has six degrees of freedom. Look, if, if we are modeling here uh, atoms as being like balls billiard balls bouncing around then just like what i said earlier if i know uh, the position and momentum of a ball down a hill i can predict where it will be so here we'll guess that that's kind of how the atoms will behave and so each each atom has its has a degrees of freedom in its position and momentum, and since we live in three dimensional space, that's three for each of those. Okay. Three degrees of freedom in your position, three degrees of freedom in your momentum. Okay. So, the data that I have, right, if I measure how much energy is in that glass of water, is going to be an average over. Oh, excuse me. I should not. Let me jump back. Uh, if if of those, you know. 10 to the 23 number of particles, I specified for you exactly all their positions and exactly all of their momenta, this would be, that would be sufficient to understand what's happening in the system, right? From, from that perfect level of knowledge, I could basically plug it into a computer and let it calculate exactly how the system would evolve. I could do, uh, it might, you know, require a tremendous amount of computational power, but I could in theory have a right. computer, you know, Say, follow this ball and that ball and that ball all at once, right? So microstate is a nice thing to have. Uh, if I look at all possible microstates, it's going to uh, create this space we'll call gamma. This is just mathematic for, for mathematical definitions. If I'm talking about big gamma, I'm talking about the space of where I could find the system, right? Uh, uh, assuming that that describes, that that big gamma describes everything that the system could possibly reach. So a microstate, a microstate could be that all of the particles are clustered up in the top right corner of that little cube. Right. And then another microstate could be they're all clustered down in the bottom left, even right. though these are vanishingly rare. Yep. Those would be two microstates. Right. So kind of the way to think about it, let's let's put it to classical physics. Let's say I have a, a marble track on this table, right? I've got the, mar the ball here. Anywhere on the track would be a microstate of the system, anywhere the marble could be. And that that the collection of all possible places that that marble could go would be your space, would be this big gamma, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not going to include, say, the marble being off the table because we're not considering that. The system, the system, I'm forcing my system to be stuck on the marble track. And so I don't want to consider, I don't want to consider things that are outside that. And I also want to make sure that I don't miss a spot. So like, say, if I, if I uh, clearly with the ball on the track, the ball could be in the middle of the track. So I want to make sure that's in there, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to miss any position that it could be um, for sake of bad mathematics, right? Right. So a microstate is a bit much to ask for, and there are a lot of microstates that all kind of give you the same results. So the thing that I can measure macroscopically is something not about not something that I can measure the direct microscope, but a consequence of a probability distribution over those microstates. So what I have is I have data, the data that I can collect, you know, figuring out how excited the stadium is or what, how much energy is in a glass of water. I'll have a, an information about what is the average 
of that probability distribution. So the question is, since I know the averages of it, I know the average um, distribution across my probability space, how can I come up with the most reasonable guess at that probability distribution? So that's the role of statistical mechanics. Given that you know the average of the averages of your system, given that I know the average that my system is fixed to, what is the most likely distribution of microstates that I would find my system in? So if I say that my water, right, let's say I know, actually, let's, let's put it in the, the So is a microstate is encompassing all particles in the system, correct? Yes. Okay. Right, a microstate, if I know the position and momentum of everything in my system. So what does it mean to average the microstates of, say, let's, this glass of water? Mm-hmm. What, what, what is the physical interpretation of that? Well, uh, it's, it's like how you said, if I have my system with, if I have my, uh, my system where there's a certain amount of volume that it fills out, right? It would be saying, oh, okay, I could have all of my atoms uh, in that volume just around the outside the perimeter of the volume and none of them on the actual bulk of the volume mm -hmm. but that's a very unlikely thing right but i it, and i could also say i could also look at uh, a, a microstate that where all of the atoms are evenly distributed across all of the available volume right those things those two systems those two microstates would still give you the same measurement the same volume measurement the same average Right, that you can uh, extract from the bulk of the system, but there's going to be a wildly different uh, probability of selecting one versus the other, right? Okay. At least in you know when you actually physically are are looking at this, but you wouldn't know until you actually look, right? Okay, so let's say I let's say I there was a little piece of plastic like a lid on here, and I spun this around so much that all the water particles were basically you know like a little cyclone appeared down the middle. Mm -hmm and all of them are pressed against the side of the glass, I could still, by measuring that microstate, I could still determine the volume of the glass as easily as I can determine it right now. Absolutely. With them spread out evenly. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. So the, so the, right, the role of statistical mechanics is how can I best come up with the least, the least bias or the, the best distribution over the microstates that I could see Right, that match the physical properties that I actually measure. If I actually were to sit down and grab one of the microstates, which one am I most likely to see? That is what statistical mechanics is giving us. It's giving us a probability of which one we will find when we actually look. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of ways to go about this. The first way is to force our system to be isolated. Uh, specifically, the the probability is just going to be the one over the total number of possible states that could match my um, my measurements, right? So as I was saying before, right, we only consider right with the volume measurements things that physically fill up that microstates that physically use up that much volume, right? We don't consider any other uh, microstates ones where say they're all in where all the water molecules are at the bottom of the corner. Or they're all crushed into or, a black hole or something. Right, or where they would all be at the top of the glass, for example. Mm -hmm. Right, that's not, that's not one with the, what's called the microcanonical system that we will consider. Um, now, this requires something called the ergodic hypothesis, which is a fun little thing. It's basically, whenever I'm looking and building out my microstate space, I'm kind of looking at this as taking, as, as still shots. And the, or, but, but, you know, when I look at a physical system, I'm not looking at still shots. Instead, I'm looking at how it evolves through time. The ergodic hypothesis is that those two things, as long as I let them evolve fully, explore exactly the same space where I, ch I change the possible configurations of momentum and position versus when I just let this thing evolve through time. That so those two okay. technically different mathematical objects will overlap in, in exactly the correct way so that they are exactly the same. 
so that I can look and say, oh, okay, I don't need to, when, I, when I'm looking at a microstate, like I select it, I don't have to uh, imagine any amount of time. I say, oh, okay, my system at this time will look exactly like this. And by collecting enough of those, collecting enough of those snapshots together, it'll look the same as if I just continuously look at this glass. Okay, so you're saying that I close my eyes, I look at this. I close my eyes, I look at this. The summation of me doing that 10 times is probably sufficient to say the result I got of doing that is the same as just me standing here. Okay, the water is sitting there. Effectively. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, there's there's some subtleties with the ergodic hypothesis, but that's a decent qualitative feel of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the the object which we'll call here, um, we'll call omega, is basically the thing that counts how many states actually map to your um, map to those those things that you measure, um, map to the that the microstates that match the data that I have on the system. Okay, makes sense. Um, now for these, there's some important concepts, which, for example, entropy, mm -hmm. which is just the log times the Boltzmann, but times what's called Boltzmann's constant, just a special thing that our uh, one of the original founders of statistical mechanics discovered, which related energy and um, this density of states to temperature and um, how we and how we relate temperature to energy effectively, um, and that this turns out to be an important concept. Uh, concept the important piece here is that we can also talk about a gibbs entropy billy can people see not below, not below which one? Maximum. Oh, okay oh okay hmm. that's actually an important thing on here um <laughs> which what's that's covering it oh my okay we'll pull this back is this ease is does this work um no <laughs> darn it all right can you open your screen really wide uh yeah i definitely there can. you go yeah okay. and then i think the boom arm is covering oh yeah okay yeah well on site uh fixing <laughs> hey <laughs> way it goes right yeah all right so um another way of defining uh entropy is going to be looking and you define it in terms of your probability distributions of cells is that you have the log of the uh, probability distribution times that the likelihood of selecting that. Uh, we'll get into that, to, to, into that a little bit later, but there's another important way that we can also do and go about finding the most likely um, probability distribution across our microstates. And that's by looking at instead of fixing our system to exactly match what we measure instead what we do is we allow it to be in contact with what we call heat bath and that that on average has to match what our what uh, data we pull out from the system okay so hold on let me slow you down for a second because i don't think we actually explained uh what we got the sigma over a set of micro a mm -hmm. micro p uh sorry mu yeah a mu that, p mu yes where this represents, so the likelihood, so the, when you go, go up, you said the average, what was actually capital A? Capital A, capital A is something that I can measure about the system. It would be volume. It could be energy. Okay. Right. Um, that, that's just A in typical math speak represents some observable. We did this with the quantum mechanics, right? We talked in quantum mechanics, there's some operator A that represents some physical measurement that you can make on the system. Right. Right. Uh, this is just the typical notation that one uses. And so that operator, that thing that I can measure will depend on the microstate that I have. Mm -hmm. And so if I want to know the, if I know the average, right, that's going to be the, um, operator times the likelihood of getting that particular microstate, which here represent is represented by P mu. Okay. Right. So when I want to find mu doing microcanonical, my probability is just, well, it's either one over the the one over the total number of possible states that could match that if that microstate in fact matches my physical properties here looking at the energy right the hamiltonian of that otherwise it's microstate zero. matching the energy and if it doesn't then i just cannot select that particular microstate i see right this is this is saying okay uh 
I want to look at the ball on the table. All right, I know that my average puts the ball on the table. Up uh, over here off the table. It's not a, the ball over here off the table. The ball couldn't be off the table. Couldn't be on the table if it's off the table. So we won't consider that microstate. Right. Right. Um. Now, if if instead I don't like I said, don't force the system itself to match the data, but instead the connection between the system and a heat bath that together they have to match. Right. And it's only the the system. Right, the system of consideration is only in contact thermally, so it just means that the average temp the temperature of the two match, and everything else can be can fluctuate and do whatever it wants. Um, the way we can go about this is a little bit different. Um, we demand that the energy total is equal to uh, of the microstate total is equal to the result of the Hamiltonian on the heat bath and of the system itself. Now, when I go through the math and basically Taylor expand this, uh, what I will find is that it equals this bit. I can do some mathy expansions and effectively find what's called the Gibbs distribution. That is the probability of selecting a microstate is proportional to the exponential times some control parameter raised uh, times the Hamiltonian, which in this case, encapsulates all of the data that will be relevant for the physical system. And and just for review, the Hamiltonian is pulling the energy of the system out, the operator. Right. The Hamiltonian is the thing that that you measure, that the the mathematical operator that will tell you, oh, here's what the energy of this microstate would be. Okay. So if I did right, if I want to know what the average energy is, what I would put here in this, you know, this formula would be the Hamiltonian. Right. Um, and here we call this, this is what's called the, uh, partition function. It is basically a normalization constant. We sum up over all possible microstates that, that exponential raised to the negative beta Hamiltonian. And that is actually a very important construct. Okay. Okay. Um, it's very useful specifically what this tells me, um, all this math aside, is that I can use the log of that partition function in order to find my average values. I can use it to predict what the average of the system will be mathematically. Uh, and that's a very nice property to have in your theory is to say, oh, if I have my system at this temperature and I know this system follows this partition function, then the average energy in that system will be this. In theory, I can do that for any of the things that I could measure, any of the things that will matter to the system on a large scale. Okay, so if we break this down, for example, so if we say we measured 90 degrees Fahrenheit in our system, mm -hmm. then that means that we have some idea of what the energy is. Right. Okay. Right. You, if the Because it's all about, in the canonical ensemble, it's all about here is the heat bath that I have put my system in equilibrium with, right? It's got, it's in equilibrium with this much temperature. Sometimes you can, you can set it up so that it's, that you allow particle exchange between the two. There's, there's different, um, slight different variations on this, but it still is the same idea is that there's something that the system is in equilibrium with based on, you know, these parameters that I can list out temperature, uh, pressure, Etc. And from that, what can I say about the state of the system itself and what I could measure about the system? Right. Uh, here, right, giving you temperature most directly corresponds to energy, but sometimes it can relate to other things, right? Temperature in ideal gas law affects everything. Pressure, pressure as well. Right. It affects your pressure, volume, everything that you could possibly want to calculate from this thing. So, in order to connect this to. <laughs> That's quite the leap. Oh, yeah. So in order to connect this to things at large, uh, we're going to take a, a bit of a turn. We're going to talk about information theory very quickly. Very nice. Uh, initially codified um, very nicely by this guy, Claude Shannon. Um, and he noticed that whenever I have some set of events out of a, po a total possible thing, and I want to know what's the probability of seeing those events happen, Right. So, for example, 
what if I have a deck of cards and I've shuffled it all up? And I ask myself, okay, what is going to happen when I flip over the next card? Right? If I'm in a poker game, right, I'm going to be, depending on my hand, I'm going to be very happy if I see the next card being flipped over as a queen versus if it's just a three of diamonds. Right? Now, of course, you know, poker's complicated, so maybe I am more happy over right. one or the other. Right? Uh, and what Shannon says is that the amount of information that I gain from that event, that card being flipped over, can be thought of as the amount of surprise that I feel when that event happens. So, you know, I look at the blue sky and I expect it to be all nice, but when I, in a second, see a storm come across and get blown away by a tornado, I've learned an awful lot about the system, a lot more about the world around me, than I would have is if the day had just stayed nice and sunny continuously, right? I wouldn't have gained much more information than I already had. But if there's this surprising event that happens, I go, huh, I should learn. I, there, this state, this system is a heck of a lot more complicated than I initially thought. That's interesting. I've never heard it put that way in terms of surprise. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, the, the way that we can codify this information content is just... By looking at the log of the probability. It's, it's proportional, some proportionality constant C, times the log of probability. That tells me my information content from a particular event happening. So you're saying that the, val the informational value of an event is proportional to its probability of happening. Is proportional to the log of the probability of that. Right, happening. right. Yes, yes. Which technically, because you know, logarithms technically break proportionality if we're talking about true, truly proportional true. responses, right? Now, what that allows me to do is talk about a concept called entropy. In particular, entropy is going to be the average amount of information content or the average uncertainty, right? The average uncertainty of a particular random variable, whether it's a card being flipped over, a coin being flipped, etc. And it's the amount of the average amount of surprise that I have for any system for a whole probability distribution. That's what our equation right here is saying. That entropy S is a functional, not of any one particular event in your thing, but instead of the probability distribution across all possible events. And so that's how we get this little formula here. That entropy can be thought of the sum, uh, the negative, the sum over all possible events, the information that I get, log of, log of the likelihood of that event happening, times the likelihood of that probability happening. As we have a little comment here, this is exactly the same type of form that Gibbs, when he derived statistical mechanics, gave for entropy in his formulation. I go, huh, that's pretty neat. And in fact, another gentleman came along, Edwin James, said, hey, I noticed this. These are the thing. These things look exactly the same mathematically, minus, you know, a constant, which who cares about yeah. constant between Always friends. put it in at the end. Yeah. And what he realized is that the equilibrium distribution and the canonical ensemble, that system where I had the average being fixed, right, with a heat bath, is the one ensemble that I can select that maximizes the Gibbs-Shannon form of entropy. Subject to some constraints here, the energy, or what subject to the constraints of the data that I collect about the system, and one other that, you know, the notion of probability requires that your probability distribution sums up to one. Okay, so if we break this down conceptually, we had the system with the heat bath. Mm -hmm. So we're saying that we've maximized the entropy by allowing the system to go into an equilibrium state with the heat bath, which means there's no more massive exchange of uh, particles or temperature or whatever between right. the two. That they, that, that the... That the systems ha no longer are going to be, yeah, it, it, so, so you wouldn't find the system at a different temperature than the heat bath, right? If I, right, it, initially if I put my, if I put like say a cube of ice in a glass of water and I say, okay, the water is the heat bath and my ice is in fact the... Um, 
is the system that I'm interested in, uh, that would be a system currently not at equilibrium. Right. Right. They, the, if this is room temperature water and an ice cold ice cube, there's a difference in their temperature. And so they're not in equilibrium. And so I have to wait until they are. And once I do, I can ask, okay, what's the probability, like, what's the distribution that I would get out of that? And the distribution that I would see when they're in equilibrium is the one that maximizes this function. Basically, I want to look at this system, right? I want to, when, when picking a probability distribution, right? Remember, when I said in statistical mechanics, the entire role was based on the information I can gather from the system, can I find a probability distribution that best represents that that most accurately reflects what's happening on the small scale given the limited information that I have. And James basically says, hey, information theory tells us that the way to get the the probability distribution that has is the most free of biases of of basically ass arbitrarily assuming that I know more about the system than I actually do because the only things I know about the system are what I pull from the data. The only way to do that is to maximize entropy with respect to the constraints of making sure that my distribution matches the data. Right. Actually, you know, we'll predict the we'll predict the same values for the data that I actually measure. Right. And this one other constraint, specifically here, that all probability distributions just need to make to make sense. Right. This I this this capacity of Basically, being able to write percentages for right. events. You can't happening. have a hundred ten percent chance of this being frozen. Right. right. That 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 you you lose your ability to like to make physical sense about this. Right. Sort of. Turns out there's still fun ways to to deal with that, but that's Mac Markov chains and uh, time dynamics when you're starting to deal with that. For now, we'll ignore that. So, how does one do this? Well. In order to derive this, we simply assume, we, we use something called the method of Lagrange multipliers. So here we assume that there is some function that, uh, or excuse me, not even some function, we put together this new function that is the thing we want to maximize plus, two, plus the constraints that we're interested in multiplied by two things which we will call here in this case two things but it multiplied by what we'll call lagrange multipliers so these are quantities that lagrange the the guy who came up with this method just kind of introduced and the way formally that we can create and find distributions that maximize something while respecting other constraints okay so basically this is going to allow us to determine the maximal entropy exactly. of the system the maximal entropy, while again respecting the data that we have, with the constraints you had, okay, and the the data you had, and also, so it's basically going to be able to tell us what an equilibrium exactly. state would look like. Exactly. Okay. And so the way that I do that is this function that I've put together. I know very simply, I want it to be maximized with respect to a, the probabilities that I could choose. Well, this is elementary calculus. What that means is, is that if it's going to be maximized or any type of extrema, right? then the derivative of that thing with respect to the thing I want it to be maximized with respect to needs to be equal to zero, mm -hmm. right? If I, um, let's get a little fancy here. Yeah, this is just a function of following the curve. Right, yeah, if I made a go. function, then the derivative will be zero here at this point here, and it won't be anywhere else. So regardless of whether that's a maximum minima, the only possible choice that I could have would be the points where this is equal to zero. And just to elaborate, uh, people aren't familiar with calculus that's because it's going to be zero because that's when we stopped rising yeah. and right before we started falling that exactly indicates a flat change that there is no change either up or down as we move along the right. curve yep um and so we want to make sure that this is maximized with respect to all possible microstates hence the little there for uh, for all microstates in the entire space because this we've got to have our full mathematical formalism here <laughs> um so doing that gives us this bit here um which i can then just rearrange and then note that this is just a constant so i can redescribe and know that it has to follow normalization which gives me something that looks ah remarkably like the gibbs distribution just like what we expected for the canonical ensemble for when we have a system in thermal equilibrium with a heat path 
So this thing gives us exactly the result that we knew, but it, we were able to derive it from an entirely different set of hypotheses. This is something, um, and so these are they different though? I mean, they they had different origins, right? But aren't they kind of technically so, describing the same thing? We'll get there. Okay. Uh, here, right? These these this thing called beta. This is what we call a range multiplier. It's basically oh, define ensemble. What is an ensemble? An ensemble is the collection of all mo possible microstates. I should have said that before. So oh, okay. so the ensemble is this guy here, right? When I said when I said um, we looked at the microstates and then we wanted to collect. Okay, what are all the possible microstates that the system could possibly reach. That collection of objects, of microstates, is what we will call the ensemble of the system. Okay. Right? Um, and so entropy being a function of probability, and that probability being a function over all possible microstates is therefore a function of the ensemble. And so entropy is a function of the ensemble that you could have in your system. Right? Um... So you're saying the entropy of the inside of this glass is going to be different if all the water is on the outside of it versus on the inside of it. Right. Which I, it seems obvious, but right. it's, an important, it's an important point. In the, in the language that I've set up, the entropy will be different between if my guess at the distribution is one where most of the water is on the outside versus where most of the water is on the inside. Right? Because what I could consider is maybe part of the microstates will be I've dripped water down here, right? Um, but you're, you're operating under the assumption all, of, all the water is in or all the water is out. Right. Okay. So here, um, this quantity, these, these Lagrange multipliers, beta and eventually alpha, are things that let us set, right, average quantities. It basically reflects to average quantities what we're setting. Here, when I set beta equal to 1 over kT, right, you don't necessarily... No, to do that, but if you realize, hey, what is this beta? What, what am I going to do? When I plug that in, it is, in fact, gives you back the maximum value you could have for entropy when I plug it into either formalism. So, And if all these derivations, is this something that somebody could look up if they wanted to actually? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, this should be spelled out somewhere in some YouTube video or something like that. Uh, largely, this is pretty close to spelling it out. Uh, the when you when you take this and plug it into your definition of Shannon, when you're saying it pops this, up. what are you pointing at? Oh, I don't have the laser pointer on, do I? Uh, this is with when, once you you know are familiar enough with calculus to actually go from this step to that step, actually carry out that derivative, and then go. Oh wait, I rearrange this. This is just basic algebra, and then. This is just saying, oh, okay, this guy here must be equal to the partition function because of normal because that's how normalization works. Okay. Right. Uh, it's actually not that far away from the, just the condensed the Cliff Notes version of how you would see it in a book. All right. Now, what's nice is that this method can be extended to all other statistical mechanical ensembles. The microcanonical uh, things called grand ensemble, anything where you allow for particles moving back and forth, it still is equally successful. So the notion, the starting point of saying, okay, I'm going to pick my distributions based on the things that maximize entropy because that minimizes the bias that I could have is able to recreate the ensembles, the distributions that we would expect even from more physical arguments. And now there's an important point. Um, what, actually, we'll get there. So as cool as this is, a lot of people initially in the serious fields looked at it and said, nah, that's information theoretic, connecting that to physical systems. That's a neat coincidence, but I don't know if it holds enough weight to really treat seriously as is the continual story of statistical mechanics. The, anyone who initially comes up with some results in it uh, is treated very poorly. Here, poor, poor Erwin and poor Boltzmann. Um, but eventually, uh, another couple of gentlemen, Shore and Johnson, were able to uh, completely rederive all of this with requiring that only consistency conditions, that, that your ability to predict measurements is consistent, 
by inferring some probability distribution that will give you a reproducible experiment. So over the years, Jaynes's method has actually been used extensively because of several various nice things, which distinguishes it from the traditional way that we've derived StatMic. First of all, it doesn't require a large system. All of the arguments for deriving statistical mechanics used the fact that you had a large, a large system, like in, you know, being on the order of 10 to the 23 particles. The conveniences, the ability to average out, average away bad results made your life a lot easier when you could do that. Um, in fact, to jump back real fast. Right. It works out really nicely because as your number of particles gets real large, this, for example, you know, this being like the probability of measuring some particular energy, this peak gets tighter and tighter as the number of particles increases. So when I'm looking at this type of this number of uh, particles, I'm basically guaranteed that this looks pretty much like a delta function. Delta, yeah. Right. That it looks that it will that even though I'm only likely to get the average. It's so incredibly unlikely because there's so much stuff together. It's incredibly unlikely to get anything other than the average number of the average energy for that number of particles. One of the so basically, we got ten thousand people in a crowd and they're all yelling. If one of them is chanting one sentence, another one's chanting another sentence. It, that was, their contribution is so minimal yeah. that it's unlikely to taint what our measurement will be a hundred feet away. Absolutely. Right. Uh, so <laughs> we were talking about this. Well, since we were talking about Dungeons and Dragons earlier, <laughs> there's a great example in this, right? Rolling, rolling your 20 sided die. There's a lot of excitement between whether you're going to get a 10 or a one or a 20, right? Mm -hmm. On all the values in between. A lot roll rides on that one data. And since it's a single dice, you're going to have a lot of variance. The probability distribution of picking any one number is just flat. Right. But what happens when I start adding more dice? And Actually, this is a fun thing you can do. If I go from rolling one dice to, say, two dice, all of a sudden, the likelihood of getting a 40 or a 2 drops down dramatically, but the likelihood of getting a uh, 21, 22... Right, because there's more possible combinations of That match dice, to right? that. And so you go from a flat to now a curve. Right. If you go up to, say, uh, I think... It's past uh, 10, uh, 10 or 20 dice. You will almost never find, if you roll 20 dice at once, you will almost never find a roll that you've made that is different from the expected roll of just, if you just took the average from any one roll and multiplied it by 20. It, 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 it converges very quickly as you increase the number of dice that you roll at a single so time. So even at 20 dice, this is, it's profoundly yeah. noticeable. Uh, at, at twenty dice, at twenty, at twenty dice, it's because uh, I actually was playing with this. At twenty dice, it's almost guaranteed, right? It, it is very ironclad. It's extremely surprising to get a result that's off that, even even by say two, right? At ten, it's super noticeable. You'll get, you'll still have some variance, but it's still pretty strong. But twenty is when law, like the law of large so numbers, you're saying I, I grab twenty dice and I roll them. I'm, I'm not going to hit twenties yeah. over and over. Yeah, absolutely. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> no, no, that's really, it's, it's, it's really hard. You'll see a few 20s in there, but there'll be enough ones to compensate. And you're like, oh. oh, I mean, the sum of all the dice adding to 20. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, so since it applies to any system size, it doesn't need any particularly large um, system size. It doesn't require, right, so statistical mechanics kind of, leans nicely heavily on the fact that though all, that large number of particles in it uh, pushes you to the average. Mm -hmm. But in general, that might not be what your your complex system looks like. It might only be six things interacting, but it's still going to be vastly different than if you knew the individual piece. Same thing with the dice, right? Uh, another thing is that nowhere in that formulation did we mention anything about the difference between sampling the state, looking through it, like a still shot or looking at it over time. So in this way, we can we, we don't need an ergodic hypothesis. And the systems that will be non-ergodic are more largely found in non-physical spaces, non-physics 
realms versus physics realms. Physics realms, ergodic hypothesis is generally fine. In the physics realm, we get lucky because the ergodic hypothesis does mostly apply. Your systems are usually large. But if I try to extend and use the mastery over complex systems, the complex systems that statistical mechanics uses to other fields, it becomes difficult because I don't have those key... You don't have complete information. Right. I don't have... Uh, even if I had complete information, I don't necessarily know... How that. to use it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know how to extend and apply this exactly the same rules if I were to try and do you know, classic statistical mechanics arguments onto how zebras migrate across the Serengeti. Right? But this allows us to say, no, 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 you don't need these things that were convenient for physics and let us figure out the easy example first. No, we have another principled way to find these probability distributions for our complex systems that's different and more, but, but still as accurate as what we had when we were able, to, when we were relying on those ease relieving mechanisms. All right. Uh, and even so, you like uh, as as actually Shore and Johnson do, you can even do this for dynamics. When you aren't in equilibrium, there are there are ways to deal with the with dynamics in your system with non equilibrium settings. Okay. Right. Uh, and it's also a very useful tool because of that lack of needing a large system size. It's really great for mesoscale. These things that are in between uh, the the small and the large, right? Like if you're looking at individual atoms, quantum mechanics is really great. If you're looking at you know this table, statistical mechanics is really great. But what if I'm trying to look at you know a, a millimeter superconductor, or trying to make sure that the dynamics in my nanometer size circuit board is correct? It's or, still or even like just a little scrape off this table, right? Right. Those are going to be on the meso scale, where it's not quite single particles, but not big enough to be bulk behavior, not big enough to make quantum mechanics go away. Um, and there's just examples upon examples of where this has been used: nanothermodynamics, imagery construction, con <laughs> com formulation states of poly L proline from single molecule Foster energy transfer resonance data. Lots of cool things of just like, hey, this method of doing complex systems can be applied to things that go beyond what normal classical statistical mechanics would be able to do is the main uh, argument here. Okay. So my boss works largely with networks. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the examples, one of the nice examples is because, because you, you can try and deviate from physics in a couple of ways. You could go to real world systems where it doesn't, quite make as much sense to talk about you know what is the it's hard to define for example what is the energy of a zebra moving through the Serengeti right I don't I don't have a Hamiltonian for that thing what I also don't have a Hamiltonian uh, is for the cost for you and I to have a link because we're friends in a social network there's no fundamental reason it's that considerable <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of effort that goes into maintaining Man, a friendship, this, right? The, the things I've shared on your wall in the past. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! There's a high cost. Uh, it 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 certainly is a social detriment sometimes, my friend. You and your trolley behavior. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really hard to, even though I know it's a big amount, it's hard to quantify exactly how many. I don't know. Fringe jewels that your friendships with you costs, <laughs> right? Um, so my social Hamiltonian is crazy. Mm, it's 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 very steep. It requires a lot of energy to get up there. <laughs> <laughs> but even so, I know things as abstract in mathematics as a network goes through phase transitions. Do I you know it has different behaviors? So. Here, we're going to extend this to network science. So first off, what even is a graph? Well, a graph is just, in the most basic sense, a collection of dots that I can label maybe or not, and then the lines that connect them. 
Okay. Do you define a traversal order or anything like that? Uh, no. Uh, you can... It, it, a graph is abstract enough of an idea that you can have a labeling to these numbers, but there are some applications where you don't have labelings to them, right? I could say this is the first node, the second node, the third node, the fourth node, and the fifth node. Or I could just say, no, 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 no. The only thing that I'm actually going to see is that I see that there are five nodes together and four of them are linked into pairs of two. Okay. There are some models with that. Or one important. could be Rob and another one Ben. Exactly. There's no right? order in the social applied. in the social network, right? Okay. It's 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 just neighbor. There's no there's no notion of order or traversing. It's just the fact that we're connected that's relevant. Which for network science, right, it, it allows the mathematics of graphs, which is very broad, to encapsulate a bunch of different systems that have a little bit more structure than maybe you might think of in physical systems, right? Like a glass of water is all it's all just kind of mixed together. Who who cares? But a social network even though I know it might have thermodynamic phase transitions in the way that it behaves, it has a little bit more structure to it than, you know, the glass, the, the water in a glass, right? One atom doesn't really care what it's, who it's around, but a person will care who it's connected to, right? And so network science is a, is a great way of taking thermodynamics and adding a little bit of structure that you might see in some of these other systems. Now, what do you mean by this, right? So what what is the thermodynamic component of, let's just say, the simple graph of you and I on a social network? What's the, Where's the thermodynamics so, coming into this? So we'll get there. It largely okay. has to do with the fact that when we're talking about putting a, a, a physical system into an environment, and it's in equilibrium with that environment, an equivalent way of stating it is that we are... Via, via the mechanisms we have control over setting the averages of the system. So I control the average energy of the glass of water by putting it into a into an environment with a specific temperature. Because I have control over the thermostat, not the glass of water. The glass of water responds to my control over it, not directly, but because of what I've placed it into. Okay, so... Let me see if I can analogize this in a social network. Let's say you and I have just watched a movie together. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that we've basically set the temperature of our next social post to likely be about something that's going to be related to that movie? If I wanted to model like how likely people are to create um, to create friendships, yeah. Because what you would be doing is setting, on average, how much do you have people interact with each other, right? So if I had them, if I had a bunch of people just mill about in a room, Right. I put two people in a room and said, eh, whatever, versus if I had them had a TV on. Right. And I say, OK, the, the environment, I've I've increased the amount of social interactability in there. And so the likelihood of us uh, making making a connection, creating a friendship right. is going to go up because we're going to have the shared experience. Now, how to exactly ma ma map that and model that one to one is its own particular thing. But we'll get to that in the mathematics. So here. Right. The fundamental bit for statistical mechanics was to talk about microstates, right? So here, a microstate is going to be a particular graph, right? So like what I had written before, you might have, right, like I said, this graph, and let's say we labeled these one, two, three. Uh, mice are hard to write with. I'm just going to, I'm not going to. You struggle when you have a pen. Uh, I struggle when I have a, when I have an Apple pencil. It's different. So another, another micro state might be this, right? Another micro state with uh, equivalent properties, right? The only difference is that I've permuted the labels of the nodes here. Um, right. And so the ensemble now becomes this notion of all the possible graphs that match something. So here, in fact, um, what we'll normally do is we'll look at all possible simple graphs. So that means no loops, um, no double connections. So 
there can only be one link between so two So I can't notes. have two accounts and they're both friended to you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, no, you could have that. You would just have to treat Rob and Rob clone as different nodes. Okay, so like one for my cat. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, I, I can't have, we can't be friends and then friends version two, right? For a simple graph. There are some graph structures that do allow multi-links or self loops that has its own interesting dynamics. It's also just really hard to calculate all those and oof. Because here, right, I can very quickly calculate for you that the entire, if I have in nodes, you know, tell me how many number of nodes, I can tell you exactly how many graphs there are possible. Right. It's two to the in choose two. Um, which usually, uh, is going to be very big. So it's fine to have it. I can treat this statistically, statistical mechanically. Now on the constraints, right? The data that I can get, these are going to be graph measures. They're going to be things that are measured over the entire ensemble of graphs, right? So here we're going to use all simple graphs. And again, in network science, what I'm going to ask is, what's the, f from this data, what is the most likely probability of selecting any particular graph, right? What's the distribution of selecting one particular graph? This is very similar to how we define statistical mechanics. It's what we call a statistical network ensemble. And in order to fully, you know, determine this, you would need as many values and two to the end choose two values. So this is again, a heavily underdetermined system for most values of N. Do you remember when we used to calculate the baseline through the VLA? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Please. Yes. No. So this is the same formula. Yeah. Following, following this, right? We follow max entropy and do the same thing. We have a graph ensemble entropy where it's the probability of selecting some graph and the information, the log of that probability of graph showing up, summed, subtracted, because log of something less than zero, negative number, right? We maximize this function with respect to the data we collect on those graphs and the fact that I need my graphs, my, my probability distribution over graphs to sum up to one. So you were asking for an example. Let's go ahead and look at that. Uh, the simplest is going to be looking first at what's called exponential random graphs. They're a family of models that you uh, basically pretend you're doing physics by defining a graph Hamiltonian that assigns for you an energy to the graph based on some properties that you're interested in. Is this going to be like a viral post? It could be. Okay. So I could do things like... Other graph properties, such as the number of edges that I have in my graph, I could look at the degree, se uh, selecting a particular degree sequence or forcing my system to have that degree sequence. I could look at different clustering coefficients that show up in graph theory. The probability then of selecting any particular graph is going to be very similar to what we had here, where it's the probability of the graph given some Lagrange multipliers, each one associated with that graph measure is one over my partition function, my normalization, and an exponential raised to the Lagrange multipliers dotted into the graph measures. Sorry, uh, when we're saying graph in this sentence, do we just mean a microstate? Yes. Okay. Yes. So each possible Sorry. configuration is a microstate. Yeah, that's what um, Right. this piece here, right? The microstates I, right. map okay. now to individual graphs. Let's see. Okay. Um, so here for the Lagrange multipliers, what we're going to have to be doing is get them is by numerically solving. If I have some data, I need to match that formula I had for average M and I need to do that numerically. So these exponential random graphs are pretty popular. They're some of the simplest ways to construct these statistical network ensembles. And the one of the simplest non-trivial models that we have is what's called the two-star model. It's graph Hamiltonian looks like this. We have a Hamiltonian is some alpha times the number of edges and some theta times the number of two stars. And it has a well-known phase transition. So visually, this is what it looks like, right? I The Hamiltonian will care about single edges and groups of two edges that share a node. That's what's called a two star, right? An N star will be, you know, N links pointing out from a single node. In this case, it's two star. This looks kind of organic. 
Uh, this is just a random graph that I generated off of Mathematica. But it, you, you, this since it's a simple graph, it's got no multi edges and it's got no self loops. It falls into that uh, one of the graphs on you know twenty or thirty edges, or thirty nodes, not edges. And oh, you said it has no self loops. So no nodes connect to themselves. Right, right, right. Yeah. Because um, I could talk about, like, this giant loop here, right? There is a loop that exists in the graph. It just includes a bunch of nodes. Right. Right. And actually, this includes a well-known phase transition that was discovered just doing uh, computer simulations and selecting different graphs based on where they set the beta, the Lagrange multipliers, alpha and theta. So here, right, notice... We've gone from what I was showing before with system mechanics where you had, you know, beta acting on a single beta acting on your Hamiltonian. You actually have a Lagrange multiplier that will correspond to each thing that you could measure in the formalism of statistical mechanics. So the Lagrange multiplier for M. Here temperature, is pressure. Okay. Right. Right. So, so, right. Temperature corresponds to energy. Pressure corresponds to volume. And which one you considered controlled versus which one you consider being part of the system actually depends on how you physically set up the system. Because mm -hmm. you could set it that the that the system has to, on average, match a volume or on average match a pressure. That's what the different ensembles are like. Using basically. a balloon versus a steel container. Right. Okay. Right. But that's that's how when you specify control over a system, right, you have control over some of the variables and the system will react with the others to reach equilibrium with the stuff that you have control over it's really neat yeah so this has a uh, a phase transition where based on uh, ignore these j's and b's there it's a it's a particular combination of alpha and theta we'll get there this is just the most natural language to describe it if i have low j and low beta i have things where when i sample from here they look similar they look like here in this area, low density graphs, where they mostly look like dots with a few links connecting them, right? I make sure that um, S is pretty low and M is pretty low for both, for beta being low. Um, or I could come up to here and have high density graphs where... Like the one you showed before. Right. Um, and even more connected than the one that I showed before. Okay. Um but just for this example, that would we would say that that's a low density graph we have right here, which I, I understand is just a piece yeah. of the one that you showed. So basically, right, because remember when we're doing this, we are creating probability distribution. So when I when I say, okay, from this distribution, give me a graph, it will mostly give me low density graphs, and when I have when I'm in this region, the probability distributions that this gives me will, when I ask it, give me a graph, it will give me high density graphs. What's interesting is this piece in the middle here. Because, you know, here I've set it so that it should be, okay, give me medium graphs. Give me the, the distribution should, uh, the distributions that I get are all so that their averages are on medium graphs. But what's interesting is that you don't, when you sample from it, you don't get a medium graph. Instead, you get with varying frequency or, or with high frequency, either a low graph or a high density graph. So there's like this critical point where it has to either go from high density to low density. There's not really this. There's not really a support for these medium density it's, graph so let me try and preempt you here so is that little point right there is that a phase change when it goes between the one and the other exactly so okay. this is what we're going to call the notion because interesting since there's an existence a coexistence between these very different properties right low density versus high density in the structure of the graphs in this two-star model this is what we're going to call a coexistence in this middle region where instead of sampling you know, just kind of medium level graphs, medium density graphs, you sample low density and high density such that their average is medium density, but you never actually sample. But there's no actual physical or real instance of a medium density graph. So we'll get there. Okay. Because it's interesting. Now, what is that second order point? Uh, the second order point is the, the transition here is, is a second order critical point. Uh, basically, your transition from seeing 
a seeing things that are tightly bound around your average to seeing this phase coexistence is continuous. Um, so th this is just the first point that it shows up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So with the setup of phase transitions and seeing them in networks and varied states, it becomes time to look at the thing that I promised at the beginning, which is uh, the guy whose geometric properties we're going to be looking at. Specifically, we're going to talk about what is the density of states. So first off, right, with, with the partition function, it's a very useful object. It, it allows you, right, by taking its derivatives with respect to the different Lagrange multiples, you have a way of predicting what your average properties for your system should be. Now, the partition function is just taken by summing over all possible graphs, all possible microstates that you could have. And this works, again, for statistical mechanics or network mechanics. I just go, oh, okay, that exponential raised to the Lagrange multipliers tie dotted with the um, measures that I could have. This is just a shrink no shrunken notation of saying this, basically. Hmm. Right? Uh, just using vector notation. Now, since this is a, sum a summation, no matter how I group my microstates, as long as I make sure each one is only counted once, the partition function doesn't care. So here, I could be looking at each individual graph, right? I, I could be, and, and doing, you know, grabbing this probability function, the, this probability distribution would give me the likelihood of selecting a particular graph. But as we discussed, briefly touched on, both in graphs, both in physical systems, there are plenty of microstates, plenty of graphs, that give you the same physical, like large scale behavior, the same bulk measurements, right? There are plenty of graphs that would give you the same count of two stars and uh, and edges in your system, in, the, in that graph, that don't look alike, that aren't isomorphic to each other or anything. But, Knowing the, the likelihood of picking one graph that gives me the same result as another graph, that distinction between graphs isn't useful for the level of data that I'm collecting. So why not just group all of the graphs that would give you that measurement and say, oh, okay, all of... Okay, so hold on, because that was actually a lot. It is. Okay, so you're saying... The partition function is exactly what? The partition function is a summation over all microstates, over all graphs that you can have in your ensemble. And that summation is across the likelihood, basically, of selecting any individual one of them. Any individual graph, right? Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, at e each... So each graph, I assign a likelihood of selecting them based on this exponential function. Right. And then I s go through all the graphs that I could have and sum that probability that I've signed to them together. And that gives me the partition function, which is only, which only varies based on my Lagrange multipliers. And what exactly is that partition function telling me? Is that telling me what I would expect to see most of the time? Yeah. Because of what you can do to it, the actual notion of a partition function is a little more nebulous because it's it's what will you most likely see based on your yeah what you'll most likely see based on your system settings, but how that exactly translates is a bit okay. So let esoteric. me let me try and toss a little simple thing in here. Mm -hmm. You we we set up my system. We know Billy and I are married. Okay, for instance. So if we toss Billy and we toss me into a social network, uh, our petition function is very likely going to come back with something that shows us two connected. Mm -hmm. Is that is that a... I can give you physical significance okay. if you give me a sec. Because, yes. because there, there's a corollary that'll make sense uh, between this partition function and what we'll call this density of states. So... Okay. Um... So basically, to construct the partition function, I need to add in 
one sa one sample of every state, right? And it's pro and my probability based on whatever measures I care about and the associated Lagrange multipliers that I've provided to the provided by setting that uh, system in equilibrium, right? By by here, just controlling the parameters, right? Right. If if when with the two star model, the only thing that forces the sys that's that system to be in equilibrium is what I set alpha and theta equal to, right? It since it's an abstract, um, since it's an abstract system, I can just say I have control over. I don't have to go through the rigmarole of setting the temperature. I can just say no uh, of setting the temperature of this room to make sure that the glass is in equilibrium with it. I can mm -hmm. just say no, no, no. The temperature is in equilibrium with this temperature. If I'm looking at something abstract like a graph, okay, right. So. Like I said, I, I could either look at the likelihood of selecting any individual graph, but that level of detail isn't isn't inherently interesting because I can never actually verify that, you know, what the microstate of that glass of water is, right? Instead, what I could do is I could say, okay, let's look at and group these graphs together based on the measurement they'll give so if i have you know if i want to know so i so i can look at let's say we're, we're grouping just just doing ensemble on number of edges and i have all simple graphs on you know in nodes what i could do is okay what are the graphs that give me two li two links okay there's a hundred thousand of those and the likelihood that i will get any one of those is going to be that exponential but now instead of being a function of the graphs themselves, I just say, oh, no, no, it's the exponential and the value that I would get times the number of graphs that would give me that measurement. And now instead of having to sum over each graph, like I did over here, here I had to sum over the number of graphs. Instead, I'm summing over the value of the measure that I could possibly get. So here, so I could say, okay. Uh, if I'm doing it via graphs, I would say, oh, okay, let me sum over each individual graphs and my Hamiltonian is going to care about the number of edges. That's as much information I could put up, right. put in it. Here, what I would say, okay, I'm going to say, let's sum over the number of edges that I could have in my system times the number of graphs in that ensemble that have that graph measure and then multiply that by the probability of selecting any one of them. And this thing that we'll call this n function of m is the number of graphs with that property, right? It, it counts for us the number of graphs. So for example, here, it could be, it, this could be the number of graphs that give me a specific number of edges and a specific number of triangles. Okay. Right. Um, to put it to statistical mechanics, this would be the kind of thing is, okay, if I know that there are 10 billion water molecules in there, how many microstates could I have? with those 10 billion water molecules where the volume is, you know, 10 square centimeters or something, 10 cubic centimeters, <laughs> right? I, I could ask myself, okay, and then how many of them would be, would, how many of those microstates would give me 11 cubic centimeters, right? That's what the density of states or our counting function will give us. So you're actually going at it the reverse direction. Instead of measuring a bunch of graphs and then saying okay the average was two edges now you're saying okay i'm telling you it's two edges you're going to come back and tell me how many graphs could have satisfied that yeah that's what that's what the density of states that's what this counting function does okay. it's equivalent to density of states in statistical mechanics which um yeah so what i can do is i can say okay let me look at my function right for average Right, the, the the data that we get, which is the average of any property, let's say the average number of links here, right in your graph. So the function that I would normally do that is I would sum over again all possible graphs, but I don't have to be that way. I can instead say that this probability, right, can be replaced with the Gibbs distribution that I had before, and since this is true, I can swap that out and say no, no, no. Instead of, you know, this whole thing measuring over graphs, I can instead swap it with the density of states, right? The counting function of the number of guys that have that times, um, and then sum over the possible measurements that I could get from that. But there's a lot of 
power in that end function, though. Like, there he is. I mean, there's there's a lot of magic going on behind the scene there to make him possible. Right. I mean, he's he's understanding abs him. It's it's understanding specific characteristics of the correct of the actual system. Yes. In order to choose. Yes. Which states apply? In theory, so is the partition function. Okay. Okay. Um, d so but it's doing it just brute force, basically. Effectively, yeah. Yeah. Partition function is kind of that way. Uh, there are plenty of systems where you can show it's, in fact, incalculable, either one. But by finding approximations, we get better insight into our systems because it's actually, it still is useful even if you only have, you know, rough approximations. It's great. Uh, so then I can talk about, okay. It, I can have a form of measuring these averages similar to what I had originally, but instead now I'm measuring based on the results that I could get. Where this probability here, PM given beta, is just this functionality here, right? It's going to be the number of microstates divided by the partition function times an exponential that mirrors what we had before, but now doesn't rely on having knowledge of the individual graphs. Instead, we only care about getting a graph that has this property. So that's okay. the language naturally, right, that we had that, that would more naturally describe here, right? When I make a probability distribution that's high density, when I get a high density graph, I don't care about which high density graph it is. I care that it is a high density mm -hmm. graph. Or down here, I care that it is a low density graph. I can't distinguish between low density graphs and high density graphs, right? Distinguish, excuse me, I can distinguish between those uh, those things, but I can't distinguish between one low density graph and another low density graph, basically, aside from some slight measures. But if I had two that gave me exactly the same results, they may as well be the same. And so from that, like, that's where we get this phase coexistence. I can distinguish that I pull one graph out from the ensemble and it's low density, and I pull another and it's high density. And I go, huh, but I wanted medium density. Right. Da -da. And so this probability that a graph is going to be sampled is the, the probability that the exponential random graph from that model will have a particular property that you're interested in, will have a particular value for the property that you're interested in. Okay, that's actually kind of useful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to see, remember if I have this in my notes earlier. We may as well deal with it here. Um, so this is the same as the probability density in statistical mechanics. You can do the same stuff because, hey, it follows the same form. What's interesting, right, if we look back here, this, is, this, this result is a sum resulting in some function being multiplied by an exponential raised to a negative with a parameter in here, and we're summing over one of these parameters that shows up in this exponential. What you might recognize this as is a Laplace transform. Oh, it's been a while. Yeah. It's, so the Laplace transform is actually a more general form, of, uh, is a type of transformation that's, that encodes more information than a Fourier transform. So effectively, when you ask me, what is the partition function? And I say, well, I've got a good, a, a good notion of what the density of states is. What you're asking me is, what does the, the Fourier transform, when I, if I look at a Fourier transform, uh, can you reconstruct for me the image, the physical meaning of the image that it came from? So, yes, I can have some loose notions for you. But it's still hard to talk about, you know, when I do a Fourier transform on an image, I get a, 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 a two-dimensional graph that gives me information about the frequencies that show up. But I can't pick out a point and go, yes, this represents, well, this represents that, you know, this frequency. I can say that this represents the frequency that shows up in this particular frequency shows up in an image a lot. you shift domains when you do that, though. Yeah. So it, that's kind of a nonsensical question, isn't it? When, for instance, if I take the Fourier transform of, like, my face and mm -hmm. then I ask, where's the eyeball? Well... Uh, you're not in the right domain exactly. to be asking that question. Exactly. So when you ask me, like, what's the physical interpretation of a partition function? I, well, it, it it correlates a little bit, but it's how it correlates is not quite as clear because I have the 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 really easy physical meaning is all in the density of states. Okay. Right. Um. It it it's it's setting your probability of selecting states based on the parameters that you place it into versus knowing what your likelihood is going of picking a particular 
thing is uh, a particular microstate from physical parameters that you actually care about measuring, right? Because um, exactly that, you with the Laplace transform, you are transforming between different spaces. You're looking at the space of what are the controls that I have over my system and the space of what are the thing, what dynamics, what value or what, what measurements can I make on my system itself? And those two things are complementary in statistical mechanics, just inherently, right? I, the moment, right, if I look at ideal gas law, right, I've got energy and temperature that come in a pair. I've got pressure and volume. And no matter how I try to set up my experiment, eat one of those um, values from each of those pairs, from any set of pairs that you'll find, will end up in your system space, and one will end up in your control space, and there's no overlap between the two. Okay. Makes sense? You will either have control over, say, temperature and pressure, but you won't be able to have control. But then the system will respond with energy and volume. And so those two variables are split up into two different worlds. What I have control over versus how the system responds to that control. Now, isn't it kind of the same thing, though? Like, if, if I know that if I change the temperature of the gas inside a volume, that I'm changing the energy in that system. Mm -hmm. So uh, is that not the same thing, then, as... It correlates, but it's not, again, it's the fact that it creates not exactly the energy, but it creates a distribution around the energy that it should average to. And it's been, okay. and it's been, and it's because of how many particles are in an ideal gas, because of how many particles are in the complex system that we regularly interact with, that the average is, the, the things that you'll sample are so extremely close to the average, Right. That's that bit of ease that statistical mechanics has that a lot of these other systems that we're trying to abstract to, that we're trying to figure out, don't have, right? Because you can come up with a, a function instead of a distribution for an ideal gas. You can say, oh, no, if I have this temperature, I have this energy, right? Because there's so many particles in it, it forces the system to match that function. So a complementary variable, maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, effectively... It, it, it does boil down to exactly that. Whenever I have a, a, a system and it has something that I can measure or pay attention to or something that'll change over time, there's a corresponding outside thing that I can do to push the system to average that measure around something, right? I can make it so that my pressure that the system is in is this. And then the volume surrounds and is, is around that value is pushed to an average. But if I say change the pressure just, you know, fluctuationally as the system responds to that fluctuational change, it's not going to do it perfectly. Right. It'll 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 take a little while. It'll wobble. So you'll you know, if I vary my pressure so that it's around an average value, mm -hmm. the system will also average around the volume that would that would correspond to the average pressure but it'll do so in this highly complicated way you're, you're not even if i know perfectly how i'm varying my pressure i won't perfectly know how the volume is varying i'll have a distribution that's close to right i'll, I'll have a good guess about where it's going to be but i won't know exactly where the volume is okay so kind of an analogy like let's say I put my air in a balloon, mm -hmm. right? And I'm gonna have I'm gonna say that the way the balloon stretches is not necessarily linear with the pressure. Right. So, so I might increase the pressure by fifty percent, but I might won't necessarily see a fifty percent increase in volume because they're not exactly there. There are there's different things that mediate volume versus pressure. Yeah. So it, it it's even though they're related. It depends on how you do it. So here, here the distinction I'm trying to make is between equilibrium and dynamics. Okay. Right. When I when I allow for when I'm in the physical space moving, the equilibrium can take a little while to reach. So if I change things faster than what equilibrium, I'll actually see this this variance in, you know, off of what the average value, off of what my statistical mechanics average values tell me it should be. That makes sense. So. Because cause in normal everyday experience, right, like I was saying, not only is 
it convene not only like is it a boon that statistical mechanics forces things to the average, it also does obfuscate the fact that it is just an average. Okay. Right. Um but not mm, okay. It's it's yeah, it's its own thing. <laughs> um I remember but that was all off on a tangent. So the nice thing is, well, I'm trying to I'm trying to get back to the physicality. Like uh, at some point, I'm going to want to analogize this, mm -hmm. but I, I might be uh, preempting you here too much. Oh, let's get through the talk, and then we can like discuss implications and figure out yeah. what the heck is going on. Yeah. To be fair, the two hours of questioning that happened after I gave this talk the first time was basically this going, "Oh, that was a nice talk, but like, what is actually happening here?" <laughs> We almost understood, but like, how 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 does it rotate? How do how do these things interact and actually produce? We'll get there. So, um, right for for example, we can do the the two star model. We can f simulate it physically, right? So we talked about we need the we can say what average you know two stars and links that we want, and we want to figure out well what's the beta right to fig to plug into that. So we figure that out numerically, what beta corresponds to the average results that we want to have. And when we plug in that beta, we get our distribution. If I have a different set of average values that I want to find, I will get a different distribution. Right. Right. Because there's like here, what we are working on is there's kind of two different objects. There's the density of states. So here, this is exactly what we're seeing. The density of states, which is um, going to be the in the here, it corresponds. The stronger the color, the more states there are. Right? You see a little three D picture here. The it's literally of, a density. Yeah. The number yeah. of the number of edges here, right? You can, for this was ten nodes, I believe. Or it might be nine. Ah. Uh, you can either have zero edges, or at max, you can have thirty six. The number of two stars, you can have zero two stars, or at max two hundred and fifty ish. Right. So on that, once I pick an average that I want the system to get to, right? So here, right, the average of this system is going to be here. There's a probability distribution that's created. So you've got two different objects, the density of states, and then the probability distribution that's overlaid on top of it. And here's the interesting behavior. This is exactly, if we do simulations, what we saw in the paper. I've set my average to a mediumish number of two stars and a mediumish number of edges, right? Now, if I remember, right, I said that you should see a phase coexistence between high and low density things. Well, where are the high values on the edges? I'm if you look at the 3D here, it's much more straightforward, it's much more direct, but if I ask this thing, okay, give me a graph. It will most likely give me a graph that's either here which has a very low number of two stars and a low number of edges or over way over here which has a high number of two stars and a high number of edges so even though the average of the distribution is medium edge medium two star i will only sample low edge low two star or high edge high two star i get a bimodal distribution. I get a distribution that, despite their existing graphs near this dot, doesn't give me any of those graphs near the dot. You it, it okay? So you asked for something, and it just gave you two opposite ends right. that just happen to average out to the. I asked for something, right. and in order to meet that, it has to give me large, large, a large spread away. It gives me something that averages to what I ask, but it can't, but because of the way it works, I can't actually get something near what I asked for. Now, is this just a peculiarity of a two-star phase transition, or is, does this apply to any phase transition? We'll get there. Okay. In fact, um, I feel like there was something else I was going to say. can't remember on this slide. Um, yeah. So... Degeneration pops up because, hey, I should be sampling from around here, but instead to match this average, I get a degenerate probability distribution. A probability distribution with two peaks far away 
from where I actually where the average of the distribution is. Well, we have to ask ourselves, when does that kind of degeneracy occur? Well, first let's set up some math. So we're going to consider the domain of of a the domain of the density of states function, and that's going to be the places where you know the measure I put in at least gives me one graph or one microstate. I'm not going to consider stuff that gives me you know zero microstates. Mm -hmm. That you could have an infinite number of those, and then. We're going to talk a notion, just L, it's linear, the linear size of that domain um, of the density of states that we're matching over. And this could just be, you know, date, basically measurements that are in any uh, K, basically a space of K different measurements that you could make, right? That's what this space is made of, right? So if I have two measurements, right, K is going to be two and I'm going to have two values. It's like a 2D plane. But, you know, uh, I can definitely have systems that have more than just two measurements that are interesting. So, we continue. Um, degeneracy is meant in the sense that when you have these graphs, they are coming from peaks where the separation in the peaks is very large, comparable to the overall size of the space itself. Mm -hmm. That's because whenever you're dealing with graphs, you often have integer style effects. Some of the stuff that I've I've been dealing with, you know, you'll have... One value, you'll have a value where it's very high and then another value, like you step over and it's not possible to make a graph, but then you step one more value and it's very high again. And so that's not a useful notion of phase transition to talk about, you know, I e I'm split between, you know, a system that has 101 and 35 pascals versus 101 and 36 pascals, right? And it's like, oh, you can't go in the middle. It's like, okay, that's, that's fine. As far as this, we, we are interested in large scale separation because we're interested in largely different behaviors. Right. Right. Okay. So here's a straightforward theorem. The EGRM model is non-degenerate if and only if the density of states is log concave. So what it does is that theorem reduces our degeneracy problem purely to a geometric property of the density of states. And which is log concave? Yes. Which is? Oh, uh, if I take the log of it, that shape is concave, which means, you know, basically looks like this. Yeah. So if I take the log of the density of states, that, that should be concave. Uh, what's also interesting is since the density of states is doing one th simple thing, it's counting. It's simply counting how many possible ways can I, you know, create this. You lose. You get to discard away any worries about how do I come up with a Hamiltonian for a social network. How do I come up with a Hamiltonian for animals moving across the Serengeti? Because you don't care about any of that. Right. All I have to do is count. Okay, what's the number of ways that I could have friends, you know, organized this way? Or what's the number of paths? How yeah, that's I... pretty profound, actually. Yeah. Isn't it, though? Yeah. So, there are two conditions, right? Specifically, that the domain must be convex. Basically, if I draw, right, if I pick two points, when I draw a line between them, that entire line needs to stay inside my uh, density of states function. Here, obviously, it goes out. So, this is a non-convex domain. This will have phase transitions. And... Two ways, uh, in addition, what's called the precopa lindler inequalities. Basically, um, you know, these two spaces need, uh, points need to have a certain relationship between them as you follow along the line between them. Okay. All right, that's basically what this is saying. Oh, ah, typo. This should be a zero. Anyways. Um... <laughs> Or you can look at what's called the Hessian matrix, the stability matrix. It's basically take your function and take all possible combinations of second derivatives and make sure that the eigenvalues of that matrix are all at least zero or negative. It's called negative semi-definite. And if I can do that, then, and if every point uh, follows that, then in fact, the system is log concave. Okay. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Um, and the implication... Okay, so... Let's process it for a moment. Well, obviously, you've, you've cut out 
Okay, it's already profound because you've cut out one of the most difficult parts of any type of summarization of social behaviors, and that's the Hamiltonian, yep. the, the whole energy function, yep. because that is where you can get just so bogged down in the weeds that you will never emerge. Yep. And you might not even emerge with anything better than when you started. Yep. So now you're just simply saying, hey, you've got so many things, here's your probability density, what is the shape? Yep. And that's it. Count. Just count things. Just count things. Yep. Entertainingly enough, as uh, my advisor liked to point out when we went through classic mechanics, everything we do can boil down to counting. Every measurement we make, because you're not counting the thing itself. You're counting. You're 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 not you're not measuring the thing itself. You're reading off the count of some you know tape, right? If I want to know how many apples there, I have to physically count. I count the apples. If I want to know the electric current, I don't feel the electrons. I stick a probe in there. And then a meter extends out, and I count how long that meter is. Mm -hmm. Everything can be reduced to counting. Every measurement I can. And so here, hey, the only thing that matters for this theoretical framework, for the only thing to notice vast differences in behavior, is counting. It's cool. Indeed. So let's contrast. Obviously, right, we talked about how... Um, well, how the density of states, as you talked about, requires a lot of knowledge. You need to know a huge amount of data in order to be able to compute it. Uh, often systems aren't, you aren't able to actually calculate it. You can maybe approximate it, but you can't physically calculate it for different types of problems. And again, the same problem exists for the, for the partition function in exactly the same way, because it's just the partition function is a Laplace transform of the density of states. But the literature has focused largely on the partition function. So why would we prefer to spend all that extra time and work to transfer over from our partition function into the density of states function? Because let me tell you, doing an inverse Laplace transform is not easy. Uh, it's pain. Yeah, it's not clean like a Fourier. We'll get there. Uh, it, yeah. it, oh, God. I cannot tell you how many times... I spent just months trying to get to the density of states. And it's always kind of frustrating because uh, you'll spend forever with like literature will have the partition function. And so you can you usually find a decent approximation for it and then spending forever trying to get the density of states and then realizing how to finally do it uh, sometimes through a stupid trick that's like, oh, if I had just started this way, it would have been easy. But then once you get that density of states, spending five seconds going, oh, Oh, here's the result. Oh, it shows it. Oh, awesome. So let's see that. Yeah. Definitely. So uh, I mentioned that the literature for the two-star model, because the two-star model is going to be a great example, that they found their phase transitions and analysis on the partition function was able to uh, give this this phase transition bit, right? We, we can see it here in this picture. Um, let's show how it works. So first off, what Park and Newman, the guys who put a lot of effort into showing this work, did is they say, okay, let's have a, you have graphs and you have a, let's, let's say they have, you know, the degree sequence of the graph that you're sampling. Well, from that, I can very easily tell you what the number of edges are for that graph and what the number of two stars are for that graph. It's just going to be one half the sum of all the possible degrees and it's going to be one half uh, the square sum minus one factor of all the degrees. Uh, the, the, the graph theoretic ways to get this are actually really cool. This is what's called the handshaking lemma, because um, basically every, each degree, the stubs have to connect to one other one. So when if I count all the possible stubs, all the degrees, um, then I'm double counting the number of links, because each link will be part of two different degrees, right? It'll be part of this node, it'll be part of that node. Uh, similar arguments give you for the the two star but the, i don't want to go into it it'll already it, that's another that's another hour sure sure <laughs> of graph theoretic work so from there we talk about our hamiltonian for that right we showed that earlier and from that i can rearrange my graph with if i take my graph hamiltonian substitute in these formulas for the edges and the two stars i can rearrange them so that i'm looking only at the summation over the number of degrees squared and a summation over the degrees, right? Um, and then for each of those, I'm going to define Jane B, or yeah, Jane B in terms, do I write them out? 
Nah, I don't. Uh, but basically, I, 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 I define J and B such that, you know, when I put in their definitions, I get this thing back out. Right? Okay. Uh, it's a convenience that the authors decided was the way they wanted to go. So then the question is, what is the partition function from this? If I have the partition function, then I can, uh, you know, figure out a lot about this system. I can do take derivatives of it and figure out these average properties. It's very nice. So here we're going to hand wave a bunch of math. And to, to do this, they do a thing called a hubbard stratonovich relation, which basically for each node, you introduce an auxiliary field and let that fluctuate and then say, okay, the answer is going to be about the mean value and uh, the, the answer to this is going to be the mean value of whatever your auxiliary equation is. And then uh, I, and I know what the average mean field solution should be. It's going to correspond to just the average degree divided by the one minus the number of nodes, right? It's the comparison of how many people am I connected to versus how many could I be connected to? How many could any one node be connected to? Make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, because the math doesn't work out if you don't, you... Uh, take one extra step you make the gaussian extension just like effectively what we're doing is we're doing a taylor expansion over what f what this free energy function should be if you do just the hubbard stratonovich you get the zero third order term the first order is gone because you assumed that away whenever we're doing yield field solutions so the next order is the second order term which is going to be found by using this uh func this matrix m details doesn't matter terribly much what's important is aha the paper boys give us our Gaussian extension, All right? Park and Newman put in a lot of work. It's not easy to figure out what this uh, extension should be. And so with that, we can take measurements. We can take our derivatives, right? We can look at a measurable and say, oh, okay, the derivative of F with respect to parameter B, that'll give me the average number of nodes I'll divide by you know, the number of nodes in there. And whenever we're looking at a complex system now this is specific to the two star yeah okay uh this doesn't generalize does it yeah uh it it depends exclusively on your definition of f and the fact that for this system one of your um one of your Lagrange multiple multipliers is B. But if, for example, right, if I had a different quantity, if I had a different quantity than the sum over K that was attached to B in a different model, right, the derivative of F with respect to beta would give me whatever quantity this that I replaced, you know, sum over K with. Right, that's that's the entire idea of the Lagrange multiplier. That's the entire point of having a partition function. I can uh, look at derivatives of the natural log of the partition function. Basically, look at the derivatives of f, and it'll give me the average quantities that I assigned associated in the Hamiltonian that led to that derivation of f. Oh, okay. does that make sense? It's sorry. It's I I know it's it's a few steps. <laughs> <laughs> Statistical mechanics is hard. It's great. There's so much to do. <laughs> right? But yeah, so so here, because of how I define my systems, yes, the derivative with, of F with respect to B gives me average degree. I could come up with a, another system that would also have average degree being equal to that derivative. Or I could come up with a system where it's different. Right? Okay. And but, is, is that knowable in advance easily? If you know your Hamiltonian, yeah. But we already determined that's the hard part. Yeah. 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 So here, right, this this is a nice thing because we have basically defined the objects that correspond to a Hamiltonian. Like, we like, no, we want this Hamiltonian. Now here's all the objects that actually will pop up because of it. It's kind of like saying, I have, a, I have this notion of a Hamiltonian that depends on uh, a, you know, momentum and a, a parabola. I will make a system that matches that. And then we go, oh, okay, well, that's just a ball on a, on a hill. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of, it's because math is weird. Uh, well, no, because math is abstract. You can go either way. You can imagine 
the system of the ball on the hill and go, here's the Hamiltonian that describes it. Or you could say, well, I want to play with this Hamiltonian. That looks fun. And then have to imagine from that, what is the system going to look like? Right. Right. All right. So. Billy, can you grab the water? When you have. When you have um, measurements that you have that, that, that occur on the system, one of the things that you're, you know, you're interested in is, all right. If I have, if my phase transitions, Thanks, bro. right, that I colloquially described as wide changes in the behavior of the system based on the environment you place it in, well, I would expect that the things that I could measure would also maybe see or be sensitive to the fact that the behavior of the system has changed wildly if I put it here versus if I put it there, right? The way that we normally detect this is through cusps or divergences in your function basically points where derivatives you know don't show, don't don't work um, we'll see that in a second but in the literature because of the way that i've assigned the slides we'll see an example of a cusp and then we can talk about that i know you're really curious about it um well there's so much it's just uh we need to we need some type of analogy because you, you just explained a scenario where uh, two different systems, the actors inside the system are going to behave differently depending on how you set the system up in the mm -hmm. first place. Right. And so, like, the property... I would expect there to be, say, a, a jump or some non-continuity or, or some, like, very sharp behavior in the things that I can measure. It's kind of like with the analogy of the sports stadium, the difference between fans you know being dejected and the de uh, between the fans being dejected and not play and not enjoying the game basically even though they're stuck there just kind of in their seats and nothing versus the gesticulations that pop out from a very excited crowd that's a very sharp difference between the two right even if you can get from one to the other continuously you'll still see evidence of that non-continuity of that sharp behavior let's not call it non-continuity, of that sharp difference in behavior in the measurement of like, you know, say how if I measure how how much does the average fan's hand move? Or maybe here's another example, right? The, the number of articles of clothing two people are wearing or a person is wearing when you drop them into different temperatures, right? Yeah. Like you drop them into 120 degrees, the clothing starts flying right. off. You drop them into 10 degrees, they start piling right. it on. So we can ask ourselves, well, is that measurable that I have phase sensitive? In physics... Uh, pretty much every measurable is phase sensitive. In fact, we we come up with order parameters, things like um, the 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 heat co the thermal coefficients, right? Those are those are excellent places to look for evidence of phase transition in a physical system. But it's not directly obvious how to come up with those for more abstract systems. More specifically, I have a lot of freedom in what I want to measure for in a system, right? So, for example, uh, the average. The average degree, I could ask, is that phase sensitive? Does it show a cusp or a divergence or anything else that would really cue me to there being a phase transition somewhere in there? It does not. What about if I look at the average of k squared, right? If I take the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the other parameter, j, this boy here, is that phase sensitive? No. Now, here's the interesting thing, though. If I... Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. There we go. What if I look at... This combination of those two things. I take one of them squared and I subtract it. What should I have? Is it fine? Is that phase sensitive? I mean, the two pieces it's made of aren't phase sensitive. Why should I ever expect to? Yeah, of course, it's phase sensitive. Right. Right? It has a cusp. Yeah. And so this is exactly what I'm talking about. Where there's where there's a, you know, at this point, there's one direction clashing with another direction. Right? Because they meet. They don't. There's not a smooth transition from you know just this point before to just this point after it's got this sharp cuspy bit right. same thing if i uh take the second derivative of the thing with respect to the other order parameter guess what it diverges so here's the interesting piece right and this is part of the core message of why would i prefer to work with the density of states over the partition function even though the partition function is very very useful we got lucky with physical systems in that what we can measure or what we can actually construct apparatus to measure is actually pretty 
pretty sensitive to those phase transitions. But when I go to a more abstract space, two-star model, I can mathematically, there, there's almost no end to the things that I could define as measurables. And it turns out that some of them will be sensitive to phase transitions and others will just be completely agnostic. So by measurable in a two-star system, it, a measurable might be how many times are there three points before you have two lines or yeah. how many times are there four points connected before you have yeah. two lines. And you could just keep adding. Yeah. And what's, the, what's the average of the degree squared? And you're not sure which, which of those is going to be phase sensitive. Exactly. Okay. Right. Even the ones that are directly related to your Hamiltonian aren't phase sensitive. Okay. Right? It's a combination. It's another combination of them that you have to put together in order to get to that thing. In order to get an object that's phase sensitive. Which is cool. Right. But also obnoxious. <laughs> so, here, if we do, from the literature, we know that somewhere in the partition function is the evidence that it is phase sensitive. That's, that's, not, that's not undeniable. But searching for it is difficult. Because you have to search all possible combinations yeah. of all the variables yeah. that you have. Yeah. Ugh, not great. So, there, and, and, and there's really no way to know which quantities will be uh, sensitive beforehand to those phase transitions. So, let's see how our, mo our model handles it. Or rather, not model, our, our, our technique, our framework handles the set. So, first off, I need density of states. All right. Uh, in order to get that, well, I recognize that this, you know, at Z, the partition function is a Laplace transform of the density of states. So I have to figure out, hey, how do I undo that Laplace transform? Now, is the density of states, that's something that we can determine empirically, correct? Uh, yeah, you could potentially calculate that out. Oh, I don't mean calculate it. I mean, can we just measure over and over and start to get a density? Yeah, you could... You could randomly create graphs, count how many edges you have and how many um, two stars you have. Well, for instance, like let's say I just go through the the graph of a million people's uh, social connections. Mm -hmm. Is that enough to determine a probability of states of the entire social network that they exist on? Mm. Now I understand that's that could be could be a nebulous question that could be many ways that it's not. But let's. Just imagine something simple. Yeah. Um, because it seems to me that this would be very valuable if I could just go measure a million things and then plug it in and look for that log concave. So here, uh, again, the disadvantage here is that we don't necessarily have... I don't want to overspeak. The empirical data is what we already generate. So because what you're trying to do is right create right when I, when I'm working with this Hamiltonian, right when I'm changing these Lagrange multipliers, what I'm trying to do is select is, is to push my the graphs that I select from the space of all simple graphs. What I'm I'm trying to push that I will get ones that match more to you know the averages that are assigned here so because of that you're you're already pushing yourself to a distribution it's hard to get at so if like because the the space right the space uh that i'm sampling from is the space of all simple graphs and mm -hmm. that's actually like going to be something that'll be applicable here it could be it's the same space that you're pulling from the same ensemble that you're pulling from when you're looking at a three-star model or when you're looking at an rush rainy random graph or any number of other models that don't allow self loops and multi-links you're pulling from the same state space so but the thing that will separate them is that for the thing that they care about how likely you are to select a particular graph from there so without already knowing the distribution if i just go out and say oh okay here let me pull a graph from the um space of sample graphs the way that you pull it determines that distribution so if you don't know right. the distribution beforehand you can't pull it though you can't pull the right proportion of graphs from here and here and here so the flaw in my question uh, of, of many flaws mm -hmm. is is i was imagining okay i'm just going to sample the network but you're saying wait 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 
how are you sampling? What yeah. are you actually looking at? Are you looking at the color of these people's hair? Are you looking at how many dogs they have? So are you... when you're when you're talking about the 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 system, right? Because you're you're looking effectively what you're looking for is is there something that I can go out and measure and like probe to create a space that matches what is actually there, mm -hmm. right? That matches my theory to verify this. Theory. So what you have to do is effectively simulate all possible graphs and then group them into those things. And from there you can reconstruct. And that'll tell you what you should be looking states. for. Right. Okay. Right. So what will matter is what will matter right for your Hamiltonian will be seen when you actually construct those graphs and group them that way. But there's no object that I can, there's no like table that I can go out to and go, all right, what's your temperature? All right, what's your temperature? And then use that data to match, to, to make sure that my theory is correct. I have to count, like go through the set of all spaces, the, the space of all simple graphs and physically construct the table before I can start asking it what temperature it's at. Does that make sense? Unfortunately, that's pretty computationally expensive. Uh, <laughs> right. Right. There's, there's, there's a reason that I showed you like the graph was on either nine or 10 nodes. Right. The, the, that, that, that picture. That's already huge. Yeah. It yeah. takes, it takes a few days. If you go above that, it takes 10 years. Uh, roughly. Cause fun little bit of exponential mapping. If you, you know, oh, yeah. do like eight, nine and 10, you can be like, Oh, Oh, right. go to 11 and it takes, it takes way too long. Um, yeah. So we need our density of states. Uh, if I plug everything in and compute that here, I'm going over here. Ooh, this was three months of work to go from that line to this line. And in line with what I was talking about, hey, if you spend all this, you know, you're trying to undo the density of states. Actually, wait, no, not this line. Sorry. This is the partition function, which is given in uh, Park and Newman. Sorry. From here to here is three months. Also, density of states is nasty. Holy. <laughs> Welcome to my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's ugly as can be uh, well, i'm just looking at the number of expansions there mm -hmm, are mm -hmm. uh so uh, any anyone just listening to this in auditorial form uh don't look at the visual because it will in fact melt your face off <laughs> um yeah uh when i was putting these slides together my advice zoltan just kept going yeah, but could you make it prettier yeah could you make it prettier and the answer is no sorry <laughs> this is as pretty as like i get it um yeah it's great but this is often when you're, you know, to be fair, this is working with the fact that this is an expansion, right? This is a second order expansion. Right. So the inverse of that is going to be this ugly second. Oh, yeah. Now, if we could ever compute what that partition function is, which is dubious at best, maybe it'll be nice and maybe the inverse will be nice. But also, who knows? It might not be. It might not be possible. For example, trying to do the Lapla inverse Laplacian on the zeroth order, just I, you, you couldn't do it. Uh, it involves a square root, and that breaks down anytime you try and do a complex analysis. And ugh. So, now that we have our density of states, what do we need to do? Well, we need to analyze log concavity, mm -hmm. okay? which is basically, for this guy, this thing cares about two different properties. It cares about uh, the number of links and the number of two stars. And so, that's what this, uh, dense, this Hessian matrix, this stability matrix, cares about. It takes the derivatives of all possible combina all possible two combinations of M and S, links and two stars, right? You have double derivative with respect to M, double derivative with respect to S, and the cross derivative of M and S, right? And what you do is we know the conditions for this are when the eigenvalues are negative semi-definite, what that translates to in a two-by-two two matrix, it's pretty easy. I want to know where the trace, which is just... That's almost certainly going to be covered, by the way. You're right. Yeah. You're right. I should do that. Uh, I want to make sure that the trace is negative, right? The sum of two negative numbers, because the trace is the sum of the eigenvalues, and the sum of those eigenvalues, since they should be both negative, or at least zero or negative, should be zero or negative. And the determinant, which, you know, you get by this fancy multiplication subtraction, but it, it corresponds to the multiplication of all the eigenvalues of this matrix, that should be greater than zero, right? Uh, or, or equal to or greater than zero, right? Because you have two negative numbers, so the two negatives cancel out and you should get something positive, okay? So here's what we get when we actually plot it. 
uh, what we see here is the log of the density of states, and I've colored it based on two different things. If it's blue, you have a log concave point. So at that point in the density of states, it's log concave. Where it's orange, log concavity is broken. So this is partially useful. Mm -hmm. No, this is excessively useful. Well, I, I, you're... Okay. Right. So, All right. right. what this can predict for you is that here, if I put my density of states... Oh, this doesn't have a laser pointer. I should do that. If I put my density of states in the blue region, so this very, very tight point, Right. the probability distributions that I get from setting the averages there will have a single peak tightly bound around that average. But if, like I had in that picture, I move it over into this region where it's orange or not even supported, what'll happen is instead of, so like what I had, like see, we the average was here, instead of the distribution being tightly bound around that mean that I've set, instead it will pick and split so that it averages to that. So here, right? You, we get exactly the prediction that we saw in the simulations, right? In the simulations themselves, my goodness, this took forever. Here we go, right? I set the average to this point here, right. and it causes the distribution to split between the two. This function, this graph that I have plotted out, predicts exactly that by saying, hey, if I put my average here, it's broken. You're going to have phase coexistence. Right, that's what I meant by it's partially useful because there's going to be some times where there's no phase yeah. transition or there's other just like right. just like what we had right way back with that graph with the splitting where if I had low B low J right, right I had things where the distributions that those would produce would be tightly bound around the averages that you set but if I go into that phase coexistence spot then the average is no longer representative of what you'll sample you'll sample things far away right yep. Uh, now, this is not the only model that we see this in, right? There are other models, right? The erdos rainy random graph is another model with a well-studied phase transition. It's what's called percolation. So the erdos rainy random graph, the way that we do it is we take n nodes, right, n dots, and then we have a probability of connecting any pair of them, right? So basically what I do is get for every possible combination of two nodes, I, go, I roll a dice and go, okay, if it's greater, you know, I roll a 10-sided dice and I go, if it's greater than, I don't know, a four, make a connection. And I do that for every possible connection. And then what I get at the end of the day is this graph that looks like that, right? Some, some realization where there are some links between nodes and some, you know, pairs of nodes that aren't connected, or maybe there's loops, but this is how we construct the general training. Now, this has a well-known phase transition. When I set the probability equal to one over the total number of nodes in the system, what happens is something called the emergence of the giant component, also known as percolation. So if I, let's, let's mathematically put it this way just for convenience. If I let P be alpha divided by N, right? Alpha then can range between zero and N. The solution to this is going to be here. The, if, if this represents the density of the giant component in my graph, the density of nodes that are part of the giant component, it's the solution to this transcendental equation here. Um, there are basic mean field approximations that give that to you right away, uh, but they're complicated, so we won't walk through them. But what we do know is that for alpha less than one, the solutions, the only solutions for this equation are going to be when this, this rho, rho star, is equal to zero. And what I have here plotted for you are two examples. If I have alpha equal to 0.7, on 50 nodes, what do I notice? Ah, okay, there's a decent component here with, you know, six nodes linked together and five nodes linked together here, but a lot of little pieces and maybe a bite-sized chunk. But the moment I push up alpha, well, past one, what do I notice the way that the graph looks? A huge component that takes up most of the nodes in the system itself, right, in that particular graph, and then Everything else that's left over doesn't even compare in size. All the components, all the connected components that are left over, trivially small comparatively. Right. And this is the behavior that we see. If I shift my, my system to care about this density from very small to very large, there's this sharp critical point where it's like, oh, it shows up now. And it shows up quickly. 
Okay. So how do we go about finding this through our density of states model? Well, I care about finding the density of states. Uh, the way that Erdos Rainey graphs are constructed in the literature, there's really no partition function that I could find. So instead I had to shop around and found another paper um, by Biscup et al. And they put the terms in terms of a large deviation rate. Basically, right, if a mean field tell mean field approximation tells you, you know, this is your average result for the system, then you can ask, okay, how much does it deviate as I get a little away from that? What's the rate of deviation, the largest rate of deviation? And that's um, basically e to the, you know, it's, it's e to the value plus deviation rate for a better approximation of what the actual behavior of the system is than just saying this is just the mean result. Make sense? Not terribly. Okay, perfect. Uh, will we deal with it? Um, yeah, uh, then let me write it down. Right. My mean field approximation says that, okay, uh, the... The probability of getting... You know, A, if I just do the mean field, is basically like that, E to the A average. But what if I want to know, you know, A plus a little bit of epsilon? Well, in order to do that, I would have what I'll call a mean field, a, a function that depends exclusively on epsilon that adds to what's in this exponential, and that's the large field deviation, or okay. the, the large deviation rate. All right. Right. Basically, here I'm showing you exactly what I just said, but at least now we kind of have an idea. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> eh, but words, it's fine. I always yell at my. I friends mean, if for... a sentence goes beyond five or six words, yeah, I, I already forgot what I was saying. It's wonderful how often you can yell at your sciency friends about, yeah, I can't speak math. Please write it down. Yeah. And then instantly be like, how did you not understand these 40 words that I just said that all somehow well, well, you wrote it down. It's like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. It's <laughs> really simple. It's some basic, basic stuff, but you're right. You Got to write it down. All right. So, uh, if we let, you know, P equals N, then the probability of, the number of nodes being part of the large component being equal to some fraction of the total nodes, the lower yeah, floor function on that, so at least this many nodes, is going to be equal to E times N, the number of nodes, times this large deviation rate. Okay? And what they were able to find, and plus, plus, you know, terms of order N or higher, just average, you know, computer science language what they found is that that large deviation rate is this thing which is defined in terms of three other functions so you thought the last function was bad well ha i got gotcha. you um turns out the density of states is something that looks like this once we you know exponentiate it and expand everything around uh it's still it's not quite as nasty here but that's because i've condensed all of the notation for what these different functions are in here now what's you know, the actual, you know, realization of what this function looks like here, it looks nasty, but, you know, you don't have to worry about it too much. Basically, we do the same thing that we did before. I look at the function, I take its derivatives, and I plot it, and I go, okay, now that I've plotted these things, what do I have? So here, uh, you'll notice these white lines. Um, to, these are from the way that I've mapped it in Mathematica, where log concave, non-log concave, and this line comes from this function and the way that heavy side functions are resolved in mathematics. You're saying this and that, but you're not pointing. Oh, God. I keep forgetting lasers. Sorry. So we have one, two, three lines, mm -hmm. three white lines. These, this line here and this line here are from the way that Mathematica handles mapping different colors. This line is from the way that Mathematica handles the heavy side function that's within this function that's somewhere in here. Uh, basically, Anything in this area, you can't act. It, the the is not supported. The system can't actually sample from here. Gotcha. Right. Um, and so what do you see? So the blue again is where it's concave, where we expect to. If my average is in the blue region, I expect my distributions to have tightly bound uh, distributions around the average that I've set. Right. If I'm in the orange, I expect to have these bimodal distributions. Right. So effectively, if I go into regions here, this tells me that 
this is where I should see face coexistences. This is where I should see not. And what do I know? Look, this line right here. Aha. It shows up at exactly alpha equal to one. Exactly the result that we knew from mean concavity, from, from mean field arguments about when giant component should show up. Okay. So I can see where you're, you've come up with a method that's going to give basically people the answer a lot earlier than they would have gotten it right. if they had had that method. Correct. What I want to know is, is, for instance, why would somebody care? Like, okay, what, what is an Erdos Renyi random graph and why does somebody need to use it or want to use it? And why does knowing where it becomes degenerate or not matter? So... Uh, there are plenty of points where uh, uh, there are plenty of physical models that you can use Erdos Rainier random graphs to kind of calculate or, or at least model. Uh, this percolation has been used in polymerization. Okay. Like it's been. So material science. Yeah. So lots of material science stuff. Uh, if I, you know, am putting together plaster of Paris, you know, that critical point mm -hmm. when I'm adding water between where it's too soupy and not soupy enough, that's percolation. That actually is modeled by the appearance of these things. Okay. Um, just kind of in the opposite order. <laughs> um, but it's even more, in, more broad than that because, sure, my method applies to erdos rainy random graphs where we know there is a phase transition, but we already knew there was a phase transition. We knew kind of how to solve for it showing up. The excitement isn't that, hey, I found this for Erdos Rainey. It's that here is a method that is consistent, no matter how abstract your model is. As long as you tell me what you care about and the density of states for that thing, I can tell you where phase transitions, where your phase transitions will pop up. Which and, is, I mean, that's huge. I could just think like superconductors. Exactly. Yeah. If, I, if I can figure out like, like a pie in the sky, if you could figure out how doping by individual atoms uh, changes the density of states, then you could search through all of the possible configurations that you could make for a superconductor and test them theoretically before you ever had to make them in the lab. Or even at the very least, you could at least tell where for that configuration, right? Let's, let's say, not even that, let's not say that I uh, know um, how the density of states will change based on how I adjust that. But let's say I have a type of material that I want to test, but I want to do it efficiently, and I know its density of states, or at least an approximation for its density of states. Then instead of having to try every pot, like sample from a large number of, say, different temperatures that I test its properties at, and hope that that's representative, and hope that I capture where it could show up that it's superconducting. Right. Instead, this will tell you, no, no, here's a region where this is, where it all be, here's a region in the density of states where, and so put your temperature so that you test here, that it behaves like, it behaves one way, and then I know it'll behave another way if I push it up here. So test two temperatures, one inside each of those regions, and you're done. If you see superconductivity, you found it. If you haven't, you know you don't need to test anymore for that particular material. Right. And that's a huge time-saving mechanism. It might not be able to tell us where superconductivity is. Maybe it could. But what it will be able to tell us is if I have the density of states, the minimal number of measurements that I need to make on that system. So basically where we constrained the energy levels of the Higgs boson before we actually found it at CERN. Exactly. And, and, and that's what allowed us to know the size of particle accelerator we had absolutely. to build. Absolutely. That level of, of theoretical control, even if you don't, you know, have the ability to prove that Higgs boson is there, but to constrain where you have to look for it makes your job incre well, I say incredibly easier. No, excuse me. Let me be more specific. It makes your job from being intractable right. to actually plausible and potentially easy. Now, of course, you know, it took hundreds of man hours and years to find the Higgs boson. So that's still a bit of work. H hundreds of probably millions, millions but yeah. Fine. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Okay. So my next question then is, is how easy is it to find, to get a density of states ahead of time? Like difficult, um, but just as difficult as any other statistical 
like measure that we've been after, right? A lot of people doing condensed matter have been focusing on the partition function. And even if you can't get the exact thing, there are, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there are, pl there are plenty of systems where you can show that it's impossible to get, you know, the, the partition function for it. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, like uh, something trying to model ferromagnetism, the IC model, you can show that it's impossible to get it if it's three dimensions or higher. If you're trying to model, right, or rather, you've got a model that captures the essence of when magnetization shows up in bulk, like in th volumetric, um, well, in volumes of material. Right. We know the partition function. You can't, it's, 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 I think doing that is equivalent to an NP-complete problem. Right. So it's like, oh, I'll never be able to calculate that. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, Which basically means experimentalists will always be necessary. Indeed. Yeah. We always need someone to measure the thing. We love you. <laughs> right. So let's quickly go through uh, the rest of these. Right. I did this for, well, excuse me. I didn't do this. This was the previous work. Um, I believe one of these, all uh, the previous students, uh, Sabosh, who has helped me a lot with this, following up on this project has been fun. The ideal gas model. Right. We know the ideal gas model. Right. It's it's you put a bunch of uh, some number of moles of particles in the thing. You set it at equal temperature. You tell it to occupy a particular volume and you make sure it's set at pressure P. Right. We assume the particles don't interact or occupy any space. Right. We can fully thermodynamically specify this with a density or a equation of states. Right. PV equals NRT, mm -hmm. classic ideal gas law. And the fact that energy is basically directly proportional to temperature and the number of moles that exist in it. Um, and we've got constants that are there. We can use the Gibbs free energy to get at what the partition function should be. We can inverse the plot. We can take an inverse Laplace transform of that and then we can plot that and its derivatives and look at this right here. Uh, what we uh, done, this will be a useful technique, is you can look at concavity lines or, or contour lines, and all of these contour lines are concave, and the stacking of them is also concave, as I can see from this 3D bit. And I can say, hey, everywhere is concave. No phase transitions. Neat. Okay. What about something more complicated? Van der Waals gas. Right? We know the van der Waals gas can capture the liquid gas phase transition. And the way that it does that is it's basically... Uh, a slightly more complicated ideal gas. We just add to the add to the ideal gas law the idea that particles, in fact, occupy some amount of volume, and they do interact whenever they interact. Right? Oh yeah. There are going to be two parameters that we introduce, A and B, to encapsulate that behavior. Uh, now we have no way to predict currently what those values should be. I'm sure you could do some ab initio quantum mechanics, but ugh. generally, what you do is you figure out what A and B are based on uh, experimental data. You fix them so that the stuff matches properly. Again, we have an equation of state and a energy function, and those two things are enough to thermodynamically describe entirely the system. As far as statistical mechanics, anything that I could want to know about the bulk behavior of it, I can figure out using these two things. The process is similar. I use the Gibbs free energy to find my partition function. I use an inverse Laplace transform to find what my density of states is, and then I plot that and contour lines to figure out, well, what happens? And I go, hey, look, this looks like ideal gas law. Wait a minute. Mm. Here's a sharp break. And notice this is at the low volume, low energy space, where you're going to sample very large gaps. So you're going to sample from things that are kind of gas and solid. But as I increase the energy, the separation starts to decrease. Just like how if I increase the energy or the temperature, I go from being a two-phase system where I can have, you know, liquid and vapor phase. As the temperature goes up, as I scale up these red lines here, eventually there's a minimal point where I can't tell the difference between the two again. Becomes log concave again. Uh, one of the fanciest things that I ever did was the 1D icing model. So this is, the icing model is trying to capture where does ferromagnetism even pop up? Why do some materials keep their their reaction to magnetic fields whereas others don't right mm -hmm. why does why does iron exist and how how why is it so easy to make a compass and the way that you kind of model this is that with the knowledge that we have of quantum mechanics we know that magnetism should pop up as a collective behavior of all of the individual spins of atoms either you know they can spin up or spin down and collectively, in something like iron, 
all of them align. And so together they make this giant magnetic dipole moment that I can feel physically on the macroscopic scale level. But there are some things that don't. And, you know, wood doesn't, for example. Um, but the question is, how does iron go from being, because in its natural state, it's not magnetized, but if I force the alignment, it is. How do I, how do I model that? Well, an IC model is uh, one method of trying to do that. Here, with the 1D IC model, you assume basically you have a single string of these atoms with a spin up or spin down, and they uh, attach around so that you can have periodic boundary conditions because that makes your life so much easier. <laughs> Always. Always. Without Always. periodic boundary conditions, yeah, yeah. nothing is solvable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just nothing. Yeah, that's, right? that's kind of a given. <laughs> um, and then what we do is we place that ring of, mag of, um, of spins in a magnetic field, which we can characterize BH. That's one of the things we have control over. And we also place it in the thermal equilibrium, right, with uh, some temperature that we have it. And what we know is that there is no finite temperature phase transitions in the system. So what do we do? Well, we know that the behavior is fully determined by a Hamiltonian that cares about nearest neighbors that I sum over. And the partition function is just going to be the sum over all possible configurations of this, you know, icing degree. Uh, yeah, it's painful. Uh, we're going to make our lives easier by changing from measurables being E and M, basically the double sum and the sum over magnetization over to number of positive spins and the group of positive domains. Basically, you know, this is one positive domain. This is a positive domain. That's a positive domain. That's a positive domain. Once I specified the number of positive spins and the number of positive domains, I've specified all the systems for you. Cause I can tell you, mm. uh, you know, where the negatives ones will be and how they're right. Right. Um, so with that in mind, I can show that the partition function, this nasty thing, um, Thanks to, uh, not Oppenheimer. Ooh, the one who did this uh, slips my mind directly. Uh, I picked this up from Baxter's book, but he summarized the argument that you can actually effectively say that the partition function is the exponential sum of transfer functions that follow this behavior. So we have some hope on how to actually invert this. In fact, we do, and it ends up being another gigantic sum that's... Jeez awful uh yeah so between between getting to here and then trying to figure out how to do these summations that was six months of my life it's good time uh you can do one of these sums and you realize that what you're left over with is a summation over hypergeometric functions do not ever look up what that is <laughs> <laughs> i get it hypergeometric all right it's uh yeah they they get bad <laughs> It's 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 geometric <laughs> regression, but each Getting geometric a lot regression. Of bad face over there from Billy. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Dirty faces. I'm sure. Now, fortunately, and this is kind of why this is why I went into, hey, look, you can use it concavity versus just taking derivatives, because taking derivatives over a thing that's you're taking the sum of is Yeah. But I can in fact plot this. And if just I choose look. what I get, 46 spins, I get this is the top-down view contour. This is the 3D plotting of said thing. And what I can see is, oh, this is concave everywhere. Neat. And in fact, also concave everywhere, which lines up exactly with what we know from other results, that the 1D icing model has no phase transitions when you have finite temperature. Okay, finite temperature, right. right. It has, you, you send it to zero, which is a thing you'll never be able to do, so screw it, who cares, yeah. right? Um, we don't even, we don't even know what that means. It's just like, I don't know, the parameter breaks up. So there's a phase transition. Meh. <laughs> there's some sort of weird different behavior, but no one could tell you what that behavior is. Right. So what this method could tell you is once we have the density of states, here it is right there plopped in your hand, six months of work, a 30 second effort to code up and plot this function and go, Oh, Hey, it matches what we were already knew. Yeah. Yeah. Which has been a lot of this I work. I just is, use some machine learning to recognize that, it, <laughs> that it's concave. So uh, to jump up, the 2D IC model, which is in between the 1D and 3D, right? The 3D, incalculable, right? MP complete. And no one's quite sure uh, whether 2D icing is MP complete or not. We, it's, it's not sure yet. It could be. Who knows? 
Uh, but what I can tell you is no one's actually, you know, done the, the summation of what this is. There's no known closed form currently. Whether there's actually one out there, eh. But yeah, uh, basically the only difference between the 1D and the 2D is now your spins are in a 2D lattice that you wrap around like a torus. Okay. Right? Um, but I have partition function. I can do simulations. And what do we see? Well, concavity still gives us the results. We have, this is what it looks like when I set my beta and my magnetic field so that I have no energy, uh, zero energy and zero magnetization. This gives, the contour lines are for the density of states and the color is the probability distribution. The blue dot I put in is roughly where the average is for this distribution. So what I notice is, okay, I'm in this region where it is, where all these circles are concave, they're nice. But what happens if I start to push into this region, right? Obviously, I can see it kind of starts to bend outward. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the distribution? Well, I have my average here, but my most colored points are to the sides. When uh, I have a... Right, because, for, which we kind of know, for a 2D icing model, right, um, when I want to have zero energy, I want to have less and less energy, what do I know? Well, I know that there's less energy when the spins are anti-aligned, right? But there's, or no, excuse me, excuse me, no, no, no. They're, they're less, there's, that's exactly opposite. There's less energy when the two spins are aligned. But if I want to keep my, my magnetization to zero, I want to have more of them anti-aligned so that they cancel out. So energy, pref energy reduction prefers alignment, mi uh, magnetization minimization prefers anti-alignment. Mm -hmm. So as I push it down, there's a space where in order to average zero magnetization in your bulk system and zero energy or less energy, not necessarily zero, but just less energy. Right. Instead of reaching a, a uh, sampling there, instead of reaching something that matches both of those properties, the actual microstates select between one magnetization in one direction and the magnetization the other for that low energy. There's a splitting. Right. Now, if I put some field, right, I break the, I break the need for magnetization. There's still a little spread, but the peak, the peak is well bound around the average again, right? And so that's exactly the type of behavior that I see. Right. Yeah. What do you see, model man? It's neat. So yeah. So that's what I've been working on for the last couple of years. There's some angles to look forward to. For example, right now with um, looking the the two techniques that we have about dealing with concavity. Uh, they're kind of vulnerable to false detections, right? For example, this mm -hmm. overall structure, right? What I was talking about, right? If I put my average here, I'm going to see a distribution that most likely picks from here and here. So there's a phase transition, but it's so close to the average. No one really cares, right? These are finite. This is kind of like a finite counting effects, right? What I want to do is figure out, well, how do I look at the overall space is there a way that will be sensitive to the overall curvature and not just these wiggly wobblies um with phase transitions we know there are different types there's first and second order um they actually kind of have to do with the with how sharp they happen so for example water to ice or boiling water that's first order phase transition because there's a period where as you add energy nothing changes in the thing itself it's nothing changes in the dynamics it's shifting from one state of matter to another if when you have latent heat you have this first order phase transition there's also second order phase transitions like magnetization where you have these smooth transitions between being tightly bound being monomodal to uh, separated now what happens here right we this is uh uh, a model called the BEG model, which I don't have the details, but in fact, we figured out how to do this, how to solve this and distinguish between first and second order phase transition using this model. For example, this model here, right in this phase transition, I've got the separation on these wing tips, but I also have this third guy, this third peak that pops up, but it's shifted in the energy from what the wing tips are. This is that latent heat, right, between like water and ice. Mm -hmm. Same thing here, first order phase transitions. I have, um, which maybe we'll get to next time, neat results on how to do that.
There's also how trying to extract things like critical exponents and how do the peaks behave as we move around, move the average around, maybe as a way to define on here what one phase is versus another, right? Really make it a solid distinction because right now what I have is basically a machine that says, ah, uh, yes, there is going to be phase coexistence and from phase coexistence, I can infer multiple different phases, right? But the distinction between them isn't quite fleshed out yet. Okay. To be fair, uh, even in even in the traditional sense, what distinguishes a phase, what makes it different, is still kind of nebulous, right? The thing that we go by is where are the peaks, where are the cusps and the divergences, and you say, oh, I found a I found a cusp or a divergence. Here's over on this side, it's one phase. Over on that side, it must be another. Kind of, it's defining what a phase is is still kind of loose. It's great. Um, and then lastly, we know that Jane's right his his work has been also done on how to do max entropy formulation for statistical mechanics in quantum mechanical systems. So trying to figure out how to do this uh, for quantum mechanical systems is another thing. This would be applicable to condensed matter systems. Really define in that field what is a phase transition. Because it's hard to figure out what a phase transition is with the statistical mechanical sense when you only have three different particles in your system even though the behavior it might go through is still wildly different. So how do you do StatMac on something that doesn't have enough pieces for StatMac? And you go, well, I use the version that doesn't require large sizes. Right. Exactly. So that's basically where we're at. That's the conclusion of the speech. What we find is that by relying on the more general density of states function, this method can be applied to a wide range of complex systems beyond those treated in classical statistical mechanics, right? We don't require things like a well-defined Hamiltonian. Right. The thing that we care about is count it. Can you count and distinguish the number of ways that you can see, you know, this system happening? And that's so much more general than a concept of energy. Even though, and so what's nice is, um, even in statistical mechanics, right? Uh, you know, you might look at this and go, well, okay, if you're talking about a more general concept, are you worried that maybe they're not the same thing? Well, in statistical mechanics, in that framework, energy and entropy, right, the log of the density of states functions, those have a one-to-one -one correspondence. Right. They, they are, as far as that theory can care about, could care about in any distinguishing fashion, they are the same thing, right? The one simple transform between the two. And so what that means is, is if you're trying to extend beyond classical statistical mechanics, you can try and say, well, let me try and match energy. That uh, didn't work. Well, let's try entropy. Let's try counting. It's a much easier thing to do. Um, unlike the traditional classical statistical mechanics for generating and detecting, or excuse me, generating, detecting phase transitions, this method is consistent. It, it, you do the same thing regardless of what type of system it is. You say, okay, here is your density of states. I will look for the derivatives with respect to what you care about, find where those turn negative, or I will look through, um, based on as I'm moving through, the, when do the pre or lindler inequalities get broken? That's it. You never have to worry about weird combinations of the stuff that you're looking at. You just do these, you exploit that space and say, oh, okay, do I see any of this breakage in log concavity? The underlying framework for defining these phase transitions is robust and can capture all of the features of the phase transitions in a complex system. We, we, can, we saw that in the simulations on the BEG model that my predecessor Sabash worked on. And now on the theoretical level, I can show the distinction between the two types of phase transitions. And finally, further work on this, I hope I have convinced you that further work of density of states is worthwhile and important for a general understanding of complex systems. One that will treat all complex systems no matter what field you're applying it to and finally i want to do just what is always a nice thing of i want course. to i want to thank my advisor zoltan and uh his previous students of us very much right this this work has been an incredible experience it's it's really been um i gosh you know just just like any time you set out to do something hard, there's a lot of little lessons and life lessons that you learn along the way. But certainly this has been one of the most interesting topics that I could have possibly dreamed of. And it's been really interesting how it like attaches to all the, a lot of the topics that I happened to take an undergrad that, that I didn't think would be at all related. I took a decent <laughs> amount of graph theory. I took a decent amount of differential geometry. 
actually a lot of different <laughs> geometry. And it's like, no, here, here's a thing that combines the two. I'm like, oh, okay, that's really cool. So yeah, uh, I have one last thing. Do you have any questions? Well, we have a lot of questions. I'm sure. <laughs> but I'm wondering how we should structure the questions. Because uh, that was a that was a very rapid fire. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. So we took th about three hours to get over there. Uh, we're a little, maybe two hours yeah. or so. Imagine try. Imagine trying to keep up with that when I'm going and finishing that in about thirty five minutes. Well, I mean, this is okay, but this is one of the problems with science is is that the you get so specialized that virtually no one else can follow the subject matter except for literally your peers, your direct peers in that particular field. Uh, that is, in, in fact, exactly how it happened, right? I had, um, I had Zoltan on my team, on my guy, the out of, which we kind of expect, the out of field person on my committee who, um, just for Cole to thank you, he is in high energy. He does particle physics, working with CERN. Um, I also had uh, Dervish and Yanko, who are one is an, one is another network scientist, and the other guy is a condensed matter th uh, theorist. And basically, the entire two hours of of the questioning that happened after the candidacy was them going, "Wow, that's that looks really cool, but how does this work?" <laughs> like. Let me so let's let's walk over exactly the small scale implementations of the how the math works and how you get these predictions and how you do this and it's just like right right even though you know it's it's all of the information that was given in the lecture but now you got to sit down and do the homework problems and really figure out how to actually right. do the thing right and it was two hours of just, which made the exam incredibly um oh it made it enjoyable it made it easy for me because i've spent you know the last few months just thinking exactly about this and they're just right. like oh we have to figure out the basics before we can even try to ask a tough question <laughs> always a fun time well i mean that's kind of what the, the goal is here with this yeah. with these sit downs is we uh we flesh out where this kind of stuff yep because you, you got to um, you have an audience right here that is not emerged in this like i understand superficially a lot of the concepts you tie in from the various things that I've done, but I in no way am I as specialized in the the actual math yeah. and the specifics of these concepts. So yep. it's kind of like, all right, well, this is where my eyes are glazing over. Yep. So the next time we cover it, <laughs> or the next time we we talk about it, then maybe we could go into further detail, or maybe because I kept trying to push you in the direction of analogies. Yes. And it's like, okay, you keep pulling me away from the analogy space, and then. It is it is a little hard to talk about specific analogies, particularly when I had a uh, a well defined talk that I just kind of had to rush through. Right, but, yeah. but I, I do think I got the crux of it, and and the method that you've you and your collaborators have come up with is is you've there's going to be times when people are trying to tackle a complex problem, mm -hmm. and they're going to be like, oh wait a minute, we can use this. There's this Ben et al. or Stortenbecker et al. method to just just Dispense with all of this nonsense that we would have had to deal with before yep. while we're tackling this complex yep. subject, which I think a lot of times that type of work goes unappreciated because it's it's those types of incremental improvements in methodology. It's certainly that it's, make further breakthroughs possible. Well, I think it has if if it has as much reach as I'm hoping, it has the potential or as any like really useful framework being introduced does to kind of redefine the way look at things mm -hmm. but you know the initial introduction of that is never quite appreciated right away because people haven't really fleshed out yet where it does this is this is what happened with statistical mechanics as the thing initially mm -hmm. this idea of trying to understand how all of these how these billions upon billions of little pieces that ah, we knew how they interacted how could you derive their bulk behavior and you know, when when Boltzmann was proposing his theories, he was laughed at to the to the point of severe mental well, so we trauma. We take it for granted. Like we hear about Boltzmann our first year of undergrad. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like he he is the one of the pillars of physics. Mm -hmm. Right. His work is so fundamental nowadays. It's a shame he didn't get to live to see it actually succeed. Right. Boltzmann ended up dying, uh, killing himself because of partially because of the. Um, just not feeling like he had done enough of a contribution. People looking at his results and saying, oh, this is useless. 
which is a message out there to keep sticking with it, right? You don't know how impactful what you're doing, uh, how much impact the work you're doing will have even just a decade in the future. Yeah, I'm not even sure, like you brought up Shannon, I'm not even sure Shannon really realized uh, how important what he was working. I mean, I'm sure he thought it was important and special to him, but I don't think, I think don't think anybody could have realized how many fields were going to tie into just basic Absolutely. Shannon entropy and things like that. Well, here's it. It kind of goes with the natural progression, I think, of sciences, right? Where you win physics that. when you get your own constant. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that is true. There's there's so few of them to actually go about. Ooh. Oh, then I've, oh, I'm gonna break the thing where it's like, hey, here's your picture. Eh, whatever. Um, the structure of math of of scientific theories always branches out, and how it's going to branch out is never quite um, obvious. What you can do with it is never quite obvious. But the power that you have when you do is certainly almost guaranteed, right? The branching, the development of statistical mechanics gave us the industrial revolution, right? Yeah. One of the, one of the, th that little bit of being able to accurately, super accurately predict how water would behave based on temperature and pressure. Yeah, Carnot engines and things exactly. like that. Exactly. Is it Carnot? I forgot that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carnot, Carnot is the is the heat engine, right. which is what is a steam engine, right? That that theory allowed us to develop this thing very very well, very accurately, and that allowed us to develop so much more than we ever were able to. Same thing with Shannon, right? Shannon information theory is the backbone of the internet. We are able to share and communicate and talk with each other to shrink this planet down from this gigantic, unknowable expanse to the point where our ancestors thought that the world ended. It was too vast <laughs> to even comprehend all of it. And we're terrified of what was out there, bringing it down to something that we can comprehend and not only have, not only, you know, understand, but exist across all of it to, to experience and see every piece to try and discover all of its secrets and to communicate with each other doing that, to share that information. That's all based off of some guy going, I don't, look, if I, f if I flip a card over, it makes me surprised. <laughs> right? Yeah. There's a, a, a natural structure and expansion that's just incredible when you really start to, you know, follow any theory backwards. Even... Right, even uh, things that aren't, you know, physics, we're a little biased, or mathematics, right? If you look at biology, the, the history that is given by the process of evolution could be given as dry, or it could or you could make it into the most dramatic story, right? All about your framing that you put on it, but the, the development and understanding of where we've come from, it's incredible. So... Getting back a little bit to your things. Sure. So what, what is the, you're starting theoretical physicist and you're coming up with a new complex system. You're trying to describe one. What is your method for finding the density of states in order and with the eventual goal of finding out if there's a phase transition? Hmm. Or is that going to be so field specific that there's not really a generic answer to that question? No, it's it's to sit down and try and think about from the small scale behavior of my system. Can I try to think about and um, use either different techniques on summation and Fourier, anal Fourier analysis uh, to just logical arguments about how to get a guess? at what the function of, you know, how my zebras would change path based on, you know, weather patterns in one spot or another, is to try and make a basic assumption, simplified assumptions that let you count and figure out these sums, right? In the same way that we went about, or the same way that one has gone about trying to it went about developing the ideal gas law where we started with okay some basic assumptions mm -hmm. of how 
these particles will interact and then can from that can I calculate what is the volume of this what is can I calculate from the small scale can I get a model of how to calculate these value you know a value for that and from there can I attach it to a density of states or can I straight go in and hard count or at least make an approximation for a hard count of what I reasonably expect the number of configurations of my system that match this property or maybe there in some fields some domains there's a generator function for that right. density of states right right that you know that ahead of time yep i could i could use generator functionology a great book um <laughs> to try and count the hands that i'll have and try and derive from there a uh, density of states it's all difficult but to be fair it was always going to be but at the very least this work is now constrained another dimension yeah. that would have been in any work yep it allows it it, it it yeah it 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 brings in a consistency for how to search for these things something that you know you could find by happenstance or by fully searching out you know your search base but it would it you know like we said before it was incredibly difficult to be able to do this i need to scoot into the frame <laughs> Am I really that far out of it? Oh, well. <laughs> the left shoulder, that's fine. Oh, hey, we've gotten more relaxed. Yeah. It only took three episodes. <laughs> yeah. All right, well. But yeah, so that that has been, uh, hopefully, I can, whenever anyone else asks, well, what the heck do you do? I will point to this short two-hour explanation of what the heck I do. But it, it, effectively, it is... If you'll let me be grandiose, it's trying to bring about the second industrial human revolution. Yeah, or hopefully you can get applied to some type of biotechnology or medicine. Because I, I, I can just, just visualizing this, I could just see, okay, there's got to be a lot of emergent behavior oh, yeah. in biology and chemistry oh, yeah. that we could start to... It e I mean, the field itself is emergent behavior. Yeah. Right? So there, there's got to be an application for this. Absolutely fantastic stuff. Um, it's all it's all complex systems. The trouble is it's complex system upon complex You're system, right. and so it's like ah. But yeah, yeah. But somebody's got to do it. Yeah. All right, man. Well, thank you very much. Nice. All right. Um, I hope you. I'm glad I missed the first one. Because <laughs> 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 that would have been just too quick. Oh gosh. Like like I said, when I was practicing this on my own, it took at least an hour and a half of just me talking to myself, someone who understands the thing, trying right, to be like, let completely. me try and actually, yeah. and then going, oh, oh, I need to triple the speed on this crap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cut out all, all the details. Everyone, you, you have perfect understanding of physics. Of your physics. Yeah. yeah, you, yeah. Perfect. You, you definitely understand. Here's how it works and yada, yada. And oh, time constraints are the worst. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> all right. Well, let's put a time constraint on this one. Cool. All right. We'll be back.